everybody, Patrick Hunter here, and welcome to the Knuckles and Gloves podcast. Boxing history on the menu. I'm here with my boy, Eris Pina, combi box operator, and also a fellow boxing history gentleman, as as it were. I, I don't know. I couldn't think of an, another word on, on the fly, but what's up, Eris? How you doing, bro? Everything's good, man. How are you? Doing all right, dude. You know, uh, I, I always love talking about boxing history. It's always a lot of fun, but, you know, we have a pretty fun topic today talking about fighters who lost in their professional debut i mean that's a lot of fighters in history but we're talking about the kind of top flight top level fighters that lost in their pro debut uh i mean there's kind of a surprising amount actually yeah you know it's one of those things that you don't really think about because it happens so early on but um it is fascinating to look back on sometimes when they lose their pro debut they don't actually use the name that they become synonymous and famous for um like henry armstrong for example or there's others that you would think that um they lost their pro debut and then what you just alerted to me before the show even started apparently that that wasn't the case and you know there was a couple of pro fights before that even happened so th- i mean it's just really interesting and especially in the fact that you'd just be surprised that i mean like you said a lot of people lose their pro debut but the surprise is like a lot of like hall of famers like you know legendary all-time great fighters who not only lost their pro debut, but got like, you know, knocked around and knocked out in it. In fact, is um pretty interesting. Yeah. And I mean, obviously there's, there's a lot of, you're probably less likely to see that now. Right. I mean, you're sure. it. I mean, the way things are built today, it's really, really difficult for something like that to happen unless, you know, you just have an absolute fluke, which Charlie, I mean, it's boxing. These things do happen, but that being said, you know, when a pro debut happens, even if a guy like, for instance, um, the young sensation that just fought this past Saturday, Carmel Moten, who's uh, Mayweather's protege in, what is he, like 17, 18 or something like that. And he's been fighting guys with good records, you know, for his first three pro fights. And he was tested in his last fight, which I worked. But you can tell those are built, even though they have, you know, decent undefeated records themselves, they're not meant for him to actually lose. You know what I mean? Like, you know, they've already been watched. They scouted a little bit. And it's so much easier now when you look at someone's box rec and the footage that is available out there, whether it's on YouTube or if you can just know somebody who knows somebody that can get it for you, um, you can scout these opponents better. You know what I mean? Well, but, people just film their fights with phones and shit now. So, I mean, it's, yeah, yeah. you know, everything gets and, fucking filmed. Sure. And then, you know, you got, you got to think of these fighters also, too, who turn pro anonymous, anonymously, you know, in another country or wherever it may be, no fanfare, no nothing to them really. And they're just kind of thrown to the wolves early. And, you know, with that experience develop themselves into, you know, champions, contenders, sometimes all time greats. It's very fascinating. Yeah, it it is pretty fascinating. It's just losses count for a lot more these days, right or wrong, you know. Thanks obviously. Mayweather. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's not helpful, unfortunately. Um, I mean, it, it's helpful for him. It's helpful for Floyd Mayweather Jr., but it's not really helpful in the it, sense. I mean, that, I say that in the sense of the mindset that it gave, like, this whole exactly. generation of people. That's what I say. I say that as a joke, too, because credit to Mayweather for retiring undefeated the way he did. And say what you want about some of his, you know, later opponents or whatever it may be. But, like, he, the guy is an all-time great, you know what I mean? He was able to retire undefeated, and he did get tested and fight some amazing fighters near the end who would have beat a lot of guys on that night, but... Mayweather was able to pull through, but that being said, his whole basis of everything was predicated on his, you know, I'm undefeated, Mr. Money Man, you know, zero, 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 everything's zero. And that in turn influenced all these other fighters now who wanted to follow in his footsteps and understandably because of how much money he made and the fame he got and all that by saying, I need to keep that zero too, you know, and it influenced the fans also, oh, it's all about the zero. And if you just think back even to the 90s, If, like, a lot of contenders, a lot of fighters, if they suffered at least one loss early on, it wasn't, like, the end of the world to them. For instance, like, you know, when Pernal Whitaker lost his first title fight to uh, Jose Luis Ramirez, and that was, you know, obviously an out-and-out robbery, but imagine Mayweather, like, losing a fight like that. And, you know, in a different... That was the late 80s when Whitaker lost that, what, 88, right? So Mayweather losing, you know a title fight, something like that in the early 2000s. I like, don't know. Yeah, like, like losing one different. of those. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it would just be like a whole different type of like generation scene and that whole losing that zero, even under robbery circumstances, it would just different. 
Yeah, the the way that TV really, and especially high level pay TV, HBO, Showtime, etc., and the way that boxing purses started to kind of inflate fairly quickly, it really created this mindset that losing is bad. And that's it's not that it created. I guess I should say that it you know really amplified the mindset that losing is bad. Losing has always been bad, and fighters want to win. But it was less important, you know, especially going into like the. 50s 60s maybe even the 70s and it really started to change in the 80s and 90s when like the the tv went from like this to you know shrunk up like that and then all of a sudden tv dates shrunk up and i think that losing especially on tv became a much bigger no-no uh you know far more taboo or whatever and then on so it already had been like that and then on top of that floyd mayweather really pushing that narrative it wasn't helpful because now, and I see this, I'm, I, I, I feel like I'm kind of qualified to say this because I see this shit day in and day out all the fucking time where if a fighter has literally any significant amount of losses on their record, someone will barge into some social media thread and say, they can't be that good. They have losses. And it's like, Jesus fucking Christ, dude, it's bad. You know, like that's not, that's stupid. So uh, when really the default in your head should be that if somebody's undefeated, they weren't challenged. That should be the default in your head, not if they were undefeated, then nobody could fucking beat them. Now, if they were undefeated, then they missed some people or something. You know what I mean? That's far more likely. That being said, uh, all of these fighters that we're talking about, these are great fighters who lost in their professional debuts or in a couple of cases, really, really close to their pro debut. Um, but what's the first one that comes to your mind where you think like, all right, pro debut loss, great fighter. Well, I mean, like we said before the show started, I was under the assumption, even in the book, um, Peter Heller's, um, in this corner, because he was a part of the second edition of it when they added him and Roberto Duran, that's Alexis Arguello. Mm. And I was in the impression for many years, I mean, up until today, he has a, as a fan that Arguello lost his pro debut. And most people did too. That's how it's always been documented and such. But um, like you said, um, what was it? Let me see the Bob Yalen, noted historian, who's really well known for going deep dive searching and really going through the records and purging and finding out, you know, losses and wins and additions and stuff to records to legends that we've otherwise wouldn't have known in the past few years. Found out there was actually um, what was it? Three fights that he had before he lost his uh, before he actually lost the fight, but. You know, that being said, who gives a shit? Because I always like to talk about Alexis Arguello, so. <laughs> yeah, definitely a, a very popular fighter in the late 70s and early 80s. And it, it was always assumed, I think, for a long time and reported that he had lost his professional debut and then, you know, had lost another time in his first 10 fights or so. And so he had come a long way. That was kind of like the narrative for a long ass time. And then looking on his box rec, it looks like what had happened previously. And I mean, this is interesting to us because we like looking at researching shit might not be very interesting to other people, but it's interesting in the sense of like how the flow of information works uh, when researching a lot of this stuff. But previously, the fight that was listed as his professional debut just had the incorrect date. And that's why it was listed as his professional de de debut. Bobby Allen apparently found something to confirm the date that it was later than previously thought. But that being said, uh, those are some early losses and an early knockout loss for a fighter that went on to be extremely great, obviously, and also beloved. He really was, man. You know, Arguello is one of those guys. So he turns pro in the late 60s, but he's still you know young this kid he's probably not really developed at that point like that right and he starts becoming you know a, a whole fighter by the early to mid 70s like his first major win is against a legendary uh champion i want to go on well, legendary might not be the right word but a guy that's criminally underrated today never really talked about him that's uh jose allegra and allegra was one of those dudes um cuban fighter who fought out of uh, Angelo Dundee's Fifth Street gym alongside Luis Rodriguez and, you know, then Cassius Coyale and stuff. And a part of that featherweight era that, like, you know, they were, there was a who's who of guys that they had to go through. And he became champion for a little while. And it's like, I mean, most of his losses were just extremely close to beautiful stylist. And, you know, if you look at his record, 
there was over a hundred I feel like you're gonna say something. It was like over a hundred fights that he had already by that point by the time he fights Arguello. And Arguello ends up stopping him in one round, I think effectively ending his career. And that was the one that kind of propelled him into his first title shot. So yeah, and both of those uh, two fighters going one and one with Jose Legra and Ernesto Marcel. But yeah. well, first of all, the Legra win is probably underrated on his ledger. Probably doesn't really absolutely get... it is. Yeah, yeah I mean, he was past counted. his best by that point, but like, yeah, and he was a young, you know, young fighter had a few losses already, and the gap in experience was just massive. You know, at least especially pro experience. Um, and then Ernesto Marcel himself, a great fighter. And, you know, going the distance and keeping it pretty close with Ernesto Marcel when he's that young. Also, I mean, it would have been better if he had he won, obviously, but it's pretty impressive. And not only that, too, like Marcel is one of those guys um, that's, again, forgotten about, completely forgotten about. You know what I mean? It probably should have been in the Hall of Fame a long time ago and has a better chance now of getting in because of he's been switched over to the old timers category as compared to when he was just on the Martin ballot when I first started voting. So when I started voting back in first time I voted was what, like 2004 and he was on the ballot. I know I voted for him a few times on that, but it was just one of those guys that again, he had a really demanding career. And by the time he started getting his flowers, you know what I mean? Like really in terms of like, having as um being respected as a solid champion he suddenly retired that was just the end of it. his last fight was against arguello and having that one against arguello and also sammy serrano i mean both of those at the end of your career is a pretty hell of a good you know roster to go off on and um but most people if they think about it and if they even knew him besides the arguello fight they're like oh isn't that a guy that roberto duran stomped out yes but that doesn't matter duran stomped out a lot of great fighters <laughs> yeah. Most, you know if <laughs> When it comes to like great Panama fighters from back in that time period, you had Duran at number one, and Marcel was not fine. Well, was not far behind him at number two. He just tended to retire pretty early. But Arguello was still young at that point. He was still developing. He was still you know growing as a fighter. You know, knocking out Legra in the first round was huge. But at the same time, losing to Marcel was not the end of the world because, like we just said, that's a learning experience. Marcel had more experience than him. He outslicked him. Fights on YouTube. It's a very competitive fight, and it's a good fight to watch. But you can just see that like the elements of what was going to make Arguello a great fighter was still like being built at that point. Yeah. He could get drawn into a war a little bit too often. He could kind of go uh, and like uh, do a little bit too much following after his opponents and trying to pin him down and stuff like that. He became a far better boxer later on in his career um, and a better jabber, you know, just a more disciplined fighter overall. And basically, you know, uh, at that point, like you said, was still developing and also still pretty small. Uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, <laughs> especially for a featherweight, he's pretty lanky. He was a tall guy, but at, at featherweight, you know, he was just not a very big dude. 130 was definitely his best, best division. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. after he loses to Marcel, he has a couple of wins and then he fights an absolute spark plug, uh, Canadian by the name of Art Hafey, one of those, um, badass featherweight from that time period and if you want to think about him in the sense that like remember scotty olsen from the 90s yeah and like olsen was just another tiny dude from canada as well so he was most known for like going to the great western forum or other parts like that and finding you know other latin fighters and stuff kind of what hafey did too hafey was a staple over in the la area if i know who's who you look at his record he fought everybody including knocking out Oliveira cold at one point but that was a big win for Arguello. He ends up beating Hafey, and then after he beats after he beats him, that gets him to a fight in uh, now we're in 1974 against the legendary Ruben Olivares. And this fight went down now as one of the best fights and uh, title fights in boxing history. It was rated as such in Ring Magazine, and um, I think the upper 50 of the top 100. And it it's just a beautiful clash of styles between two all time greats. You know, Olivares, who legendary bantamweight champion, then when he you know, lost the title over there, moved up the featherweight, knocked out Bobby Chacon, and was going on another little rampaging act. Was one of those guys that before the partying, outside the ring activities and the drinking and everything else really, really caught up to him was incredible. You know, not only was he like a left hook specialist that could knock you cold, but he could box too. Like he was just a brilliant fighter. And even though he was, you know, size difference was pretty substantial, excuse me, between him and Arguello, 
it's still just a, a you know an interesting contrast right there like Arguello still is not his absolute peak yet he's better than he was when he fought Marcel and he's you know as ready as he's ever going to be for his first title fight but he's fighting a legend and Ali Barris who could be up and down at Topsy Turvy with his performances was peaking at this fight like you know he was on all cylinders and was beating um, Arguello for that point he was out boxing him he was out hustling him and out slugging him and at one point, he rocked Arguello and had him reeling a little bit. But, I mean, Arguello was still nip and tuck with him. He was just a couple of steps behind until finally when he broke through and then, you know, a beautiful combination. Pop, pop, was like an uppercut and a hook or something, right? And Olivares, you know, as he tended to do when he was knocked out, kind of fell in sections and just laid there. And, you know, Arguello's uh, reign began. Yeah, unfortunately, like a lot of punchers, Olivares had that that issue where, like, you know, once he started to kind of fade, he was he was out, dude. <laughs> like, you know, he yeah. once he faded, he was faded, and once you knocked him down or had kind of worn him out, like he would do that thing where he'd be like, Egh. yeah, exactly. He'd, he'd go to the canvas and just be like, ah, ah, ah you know, like in a comic like book Chiquita or something. Kind of like Gonzalez in the sense that, like, you know, Gonzalez would be banging away and beating the hell out of you and. Like in the first Carvajal fight when he finally got dropped and he was out and he just kind of boom, you know? <laughs> yeah, just done, like exhausted almost. And that's kind of what it looked like. But obviously a massive, massive win for Arguello because Olivares is one of the greatest Mexican fighters of all time. Um, Obviously doesn't get put into that conversation nearly as much. It seems like these days it's kind of like you're either a Chavez guy or a Sanchez guy and like whatever. I'm not going to argue whatever anybody wants, but... Olivares should definitely be in that discussion as among the greatest Mexican fighters of all time. And uh, obviously he had been through a lot of fights by this period. But that being said, you know, uh, Arguello definitely had to walk through some shit to get that win. He did. I mean, Olivares, like I said, was winning on the on two of the three cards on that fight. And he was out slugging him. You know what I mean? Like, but Olivares wasn't just an out and out slugger. He could box too. And he was just mixing both of them together. And Arguello was kind of, you know, still, he was following him. He's still a little bit plotting at that point. He's taller and lankier, but, like, he's not a swift boxer or nothing that's going to move around gracefully. Like, it was like a nip-and-tuck affair, but Olivares, it was a lot of phone booth in there, too. Olivares was getting the better of it. But once Arguello finally broke through and started breaking him down by round 13, it was a wrap. And once he caught him with that combination and Olivares dropped the way he did, I mean, you know, it was a passing of the torch. And it was, like you said, that was an amazing win for um Arguello probably won the top definitely top five of his career and um Oliveira still wasn't done he'd go on to win the featherweight title again before you know finally pettering out in the late 70s but that being said Arguello you know dominates the featherweight division for the next couple of years before this became a pattern for him he when he moves up and I mean a guy with his size all right you knew it was eventually going to happen no one his size is going to be able to stay at 126 forever like that's just criminally killing your body at that point you know, look at a dude like Robert Guerrero, who started at, what, 126, and he ended up at fucking junior midway practically now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you knew eventually it was going to happen, but what became a pattern for Arguello was that anytime he moved up and would challenge a new champion in that division, he seeked out the toughest one of that, what he felt was the toughest one. It wasn't like going up there and being like, oh, okay, you know, I'll just take, like, an easy pacing for whatever it was. So you had the WBC champion, you had the WBA champion, you know what I mean? And... Arguello decides to move up and he was going to challenge, um, not, not Sammy Serrano. What was it? Alfredo, um, Alfredo Escalara, mm -hmm. who tough as nails, dude. Um, pain, in the ass. Fighter. Hmm? pain in the ass, just a, a not an ass easy fighter, guy yeah. fight. You know, and a guy who like kind of relished taking punishment could take a lot of it and was most known for walking around with a snake around his neck. And um, so now you're thinking, what year was that when that fight took place? It was around what, 78. Oh, 78. Yeah. So by this point, Arguello now is becoming a part of the boom of boxing where like a lot of these champions are being, you know, recognized and televised and stuff like that. And Arguello also was benefited by the influx of like just the whole world, when like the actual world champion coming in. So what I mean by that is that like everyone talks today about how like oh you know especially when during the Klitschko era oh I wish we had an American heavyweight champion we're missing that we're missing that while a lot of American champions dominate you know the rest of the sport think about this at one point in 1976 there was only one American champion in boxing one that was Muhammad Ali every single division under that had champions from other countries 
And a lot of them were from Latin American countries, including, you know, obviously Arguello. And he benefited from it because there was like a surge in popularity in boxing amongst all of that and also being televised, yep. you know? So, yeah, in the late 60s and throughout the 70s, especially on the West Coast, Madison Square Garden too remained, you know, a player yeah. throughout. But in the the West Coast started to kind of rise again, Forum, Olympic Auditorium, which also held a lot of wrestling and other events too. And so uh, a lot of Mexicans, Mexican-Americans, a lot of other Latinos had also started to really uh, help boost sales and attendance and also TV as well. And so, look, dude, ch check it out. You got all the way from what we were talking about, Olivares fight, all the way up to Escalera. You have him defending uh, against Lionel Hernandez in Caracas, Venezuela. Yep. Roberto Riasco in uh, Granada, Nicaragua. You have fucking Royal Kobayashi in Japan. Uh, Jose Torres in non-title fight in Mexicali. I mean, uh, then the back against Sal, Sal Torres in uh, the forum again. You know, and then he he fights. Let's see who else. Jerome Artis, who was an AAU champion uh, in in a a uh, amateur standout, and was probably supposed to go on to be a lot better than he wound up being. But that being said, fought him at Madison Square Garden. On the I mean, you know, of this Ali is Shavers. what's that? Uh, that was on the undercard of Ali Shavers. Dude fought around the world and fought pretty much whomever. And this is like you're talking about. I think that had a lot of influence on it. And uh, Ali did too, because Ali also fought around the world and was truly, you know, some of the fights were like ridiculous, but he did, you know, travel the world and show, you know, fought in various countries, different venues and shit like that. And also went around to the countryside, visited the people, all that sort of shit. It's not the kind of shit that you see a lot of heavyweight champions or any champions doing these days. Um, and I mean, whatever, they can do whatever the fuck they want, but we're just obviously talking about a completely different time here. This is not something you'd see a lot of champions doing. Absolutely. I mean, he was the definition of a world champion. And by the time he fights Escalera in the late seventies, We've talked about him in, um, in other shows. In before. Puerto Rico, by the way, sorry. But yeah. he fights Escalera in Puerto Rico. For their first title fight, yeah. And it's interesting, too. Like, we brought up Escalera because we talked about him on a previous episode a long time ago when we discussed um, Tyrone Everett. He was a part of one of the most scandalous, if not the most scandalous decision in boxing history involving a title fight. And um, so... That's what he's usually most known for, but he was a scrappy ass dude, and like you said, a pain in the ass to fight, and a respected champion at that point too. One of those guys that like kind of got lost in the shuffles of the mid seventies because there was so many great champions at that point. But he was a dude who you know was churning along in a tough division, and he'd beat some you know rather good fighters too. And um, so by the time Arguello moves up to fight him, it was one of those that yeah, Arguello was the favorite, and. Proved his dominance early on. Like he slashed our Escalara's face up, who was prone to cuts and kind of beat the shit out of him, too. Where it looked like, you know, Escalara looked like he was kind of a mugging victim. But I, I, like I mentioned, he was one of those guys that had a fast recovery and he was brave as shit. And he really put up a nasty fight where he slid at Arguello's eyes, too, like made him really bruised up. And it was a back and forth battle. And Arguello had to come through hell for that. But I mean, like, you always got the sense Arguello was a stronger fighter throughout, but like Escalera was just really, really plucky and had those moments where you got excited thinking, oh shit, he might have a chance to like really turn it around before Arguello would like assume dominance. But really, you know, great performance and it felt well that because now he's at 130, his body's filling out more, he's taller and stuff like that. And now it's just like a whole nother gener uh, division for him to dominate. Yeah, which he pretty much did. I mean, like he went through just about the top 10. Uh, from that point, including uh, a rematch with Escalera, you know, Bazooka Limon before he was, you know, <laughs> totally out. But he had, you know, all action fighter, Bobby Chacon, also another all action fighter. Um, a lot of these guys had already kind of softened each other up against each other in the mid to late 70s. And so, to be fair, it's not like uh, Arguello was getting unbeaten or prime versions of all of these fighters but nonetheless you can only defeat the fighters that are ahead of you and he did you know he yeah. took out Escalera and basically just took out the top 10. I mean those were like when you think about it too Lamone and Chacon 
both of them, like Chacon at that point was already a champion, a little burnt out by the late seventies, considering everything, but he still had an amazing run to come of him in the early eighties. Lamon in the sense too, um, even though he had a, a long career at this point by the late seventies, he still was got his best moments were going to come in the early eighties. Arguello was able to stop both of them. He struggled more with Chacon, but I mean, still like those were big wins. And then you also have to mention too, he fights Ruben Castillo, who at that point was an absolute sensation. You know, when you read about the um, the ring magazines of the late seventies, he's always featured in like one of those little mini columns, notching another win and doing stuff like that. Everybody thought he was going to be a future champion, and rightfully so. I mean, he was a brilliant fighter on the early on the early onset. And for Arguello in his last fight of that division to give a guy like Castillo a title fight, um, in today's day and age, that would probably you know, the way pay-per-view goes and stuff like that, that would probably end up being the head of a pay-per-view. Yeah, that'd be the ultra mega event Super Bowl yeah. fucking, you know. <laughs> it would be a big, it absolutely would be a big one. Oh man, we can't cast Theo against our boy, oh, holy shit. And like, rightfully so, but then, you know, back Not in the earth. since 1911 has, yeah. <laughs> but on the onset of the new decade of 1980, no, nah, that was going to be the head of ABC or CBS or whatever channel it was going to be on, you know what I mean? Dude, well, just just look at this fucking basically murderer's row from Escalera to Limon, Chacon, yep. Castillo, Rolando Navarrete himself, a complete yeah. pain in the fucking ass to fight. Cornelius Boza Edwards, Jose Luis Ramirez, just an entire set of badasses, guys who either hit hard or can fight their asses off. And he went through all of them, like and back to back to back to back guys... to back. And all these guys had their best moments after fighting Arguello. Like, you know, Ramirez, I mean, look at his record. He was already 67 and two. But if you think about it, he's probably pro when he was like 14 or 15, like just logging in those fights. But it's incredible to think that, yeah, like those are, that's an absolute murderer's role of opponents right there who would end up, you know, for the most part, fighting each other at some point or another. Like Ramirez ended the career of uh, Boza Edwards. Um, and he would go on just to defeat Edwin Rosario. Yeah, was Rosario. At the time. Yeah, was was crazy. Fight Camacho, Chavez, give Whitaker his first loss that we just mentioned slightly earlier. Like he had a full career himself. He's on the ballot for the Hall of Fame. Um, Boza Edwards would go on to fight Chacon in absolute bloodbaths, especially their second fight. You know, had fights with Navarrete, had fights with um, Bazooka Lamon and Camacho and others. Like he'd become a staple on television. And Navarrete, who ends up stopping Boza Edwards, would go on to have an absolute firefight with Bazooka Lamone and others, too. Like, you know, like you said, man, so it's just brilliant work right there. And this is all before, like, Arguello was really became a mainstream, main uh, mainstay on TV and, like, uh, a household name. And that wouldn't come until after he moved to lightweight. So he goes through junior, white, uh, junior lightweight, and then he moves up to lightweight in 1981. And he challenges Jim Watt for the championship. And I, I don't know if the timeline is right here, so correct me if I'm wrong. But was he originally supposed to fight Kilmer Kenty on that "This Is It" card, or something to that to something to that effect? You because, might be right. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, you know. And even then, like, like there was a couple of other big fights Arguello was rumored to have. I just want to mention that before we move on. But like, there was rumors of him when Duran was lightweight champion of him and Arguello was supposed to fight each other a couple of times. And there's that famous photo of Duran menacingly holding a photo of Arguello. Wow, and he's I'm like, so you know, blind. I'm having to like look. I'm like, huh. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm trying to see if there was a. So I know I had an article about it. Oh no. Yeah, I I can't remember who he was supposed to fight on that card, but the card that you were talking about is that mega card that was supposed yeah. to happen from Muhammad Ali uh, Professional Sports, which we talked about on a show. But yeah, Arguello was supposed to be on that card. Yeah. So, anyways, even back in the in the mid seventies, there was a lot of discussion about him and Duran fighting, and then you have that famous photo of Duran, you know, as a lightweight holding the photo of Arguello and you know menacingly doing stuff like that, but that never came to fruition. But um, anyways, Arguello, you know, like I said, he's featured on television and like boxing fans know him, but he became a household name soon after he becomes lightweight champion. So he moves up in 81. He fights Jim Watt. And Jim Watt at this point is kind of near the end of his career, but longtime respected fighter and became champion a little bit near, you know, at the later part of his career. But still, for a guy like that, he was um, 
he stopped Sean O'Grady um, on cuts in a somewhat dubious on, on circumstances, but still, that was a big win for him. But the biggest win for him, and the one that just kind of made him realize they were like, wow, you know, this guy's a legit guy, is when he completely outboxed Howard Davis Jr. to defend his championship. You know, Davis Jr., the Val um, Barker, 76 Olympic champion, and was supposed to be, you know, fast trotted to a world championship and um, out of the 76 team. And when he fought Watt in Scotland, it was just like one of those fights where he kind of ended up showing his limitations that he ended up showing throughout the rest of his career. You know I mean? Watt took advantage of it. And it's not a fight that's actually a really difficult fight to find. I, I watched it once years ago when I think it surfaced on YouTube, but it hasn't been up there for years and I wouldn't know where else to find it, nor that I'm looking for it. But anyways... It was just one of those fights that Watt really solidified and outboxed him and showed his experience and showed him to be like a legitimate, thorough, you know, thorough professional. And so by the time he fought Arguello, this ends up being his last fight as well. He puts up a good fight, you know what I mean? Like he's he's competitive throughout and he never gets stopped, but he gets dropped, he gets outboxed, and Arguello wins a comprehensive decision. So now we're in the middle of 1981, and now his next fight is the one that makes him a household name because he goes against the matinee idol, Ray Mancini. Yeah, I was just going to quickly mention that Jim Watts often mentioned as one of the greatest uh, Scottish fighters of all times. And, you know, Ken Buchanan is almost always at the top, but and he, as he should be. But nonetheless, Jim Watt gets some love. Um, but yeah, you know, the, the lightweight division, I wouldn't say that it was ripe for the picking, but it was definitely, I mean, there was really only room for Arguello to grow with his stature. Uh, and he did, even though 130 was his his uh, best weight, he still took up good power to 135 and had adjusted his style just a little bit so that he wasn't brawling quite as much. He was using his length and his jab just a little bit more. And, I, uh, you know, the fight between he and Ray Mancini was highly anticipated. Ray Mancini was undefeated at the time. As you said, a matinee idol, young, good-looking kid had a dad who was previously a contender at, I'm pretty sure, lightweight as well. Um, and, you know, he had a great story, carried the hopes of hopes and dreams of Youngstown, Ohio on his back. Youngstown, Ohio was, a t or and is, a town along the Rust Belt in Ohio, which is like former kind of mining and industrial towns that have just gone to shit because those jobs just dried up. And so the towns were just left to rot. And Youngstown, Ohio had this kind of reputation as being one of those towns. So out in the middle of nowhere, Youngstown, Ohio is Ray Mancini fucking rising up from the ashes and shit. And that's pretty much how this entire fight was pegged. Whereas Alexis Arguello, you know, had also uh, Nicaragua was going through its own difficulty and still is. And so Alexis Arguello was deemed a hero for his people. Um, you know, this, and so this was the kind of the ultimate showdown to see if experience and class, uh, in terms of boxing class, of course, could defeat youth and tenacity and hope or whatever you want to call it. And also, of course, fucking white network America, of course, that was a, a driving force behind it as it always is. But it wound up being a, an extremely entertaining fight with a bunch of, uh, you know, touching post fight moments as well. It really did, man. I mean, Mancini fought his heart out throughout, had a lot of success early on. Arguello obviously showed his class and brutally stopped him at the end. Like, that was, you know, that knockout yeah, at the end. That's a rough fight. Off, off yeah, the last few rounds yeah. are kind of like, Ugh. Yeah, it is. And, you know, Mancini is usually called, like, the 80s. Like, he's compared to, like, Gotti of the 80s type of sub, and rightfully so. You know, you can get the comparisons, but, like, he definitely... um I don't know if Gotti would be able to survive 14 rounds with Arguello back then. Like, that was just type of different animal. Mancini's kind of underrated. Like I said, the whole matinee idol and the whole thing about him being all wholesome and all that. And, like, just now, he wasn't he wasn't that out and out brawler. Like, he could box. I mean, yeah, he would slug and he got marked up and stuff like that. But, like, he did outbox. Yeah, he's, like, an fighter. aggressive counterpuncher, dude. Yeah. Like, he was, he was a good fighter. He was a very good fighter. I mean, he basically shut out Ramirez before in – or around the time that Arguello fought him. Arguello struggled like shit against him. So, I mean, like, he was a very good fighter. But anyways, Arguello showed his class and stopped him. But it was the post-fight interview where everyone fell in love because he's there, Mancini's there with his dad. They're kind of consoling each other. 
in our Goyos being interviewed and he's like, you know, I love your father, man. He was like, I love your father. Like I love mine and anything I can do for you all. Just let me know, please. I would just love to. And they're all saying, thank you. And everyone's crying. And the fuck can you hate that, man? Like that was genuine. There was no bullshit there. There was no feeling of nothing. Like it was, that wasn't forced. That was our Goyo. That was generally how he was. And that's why the public loved yeah. him. And Everyone loved him. loved him because he was a gentleman. He was one of those fighters that you were like, wow, he is the most wholesome person that I like, if your daughter brought him home for dinner, you'd be happy because like, you know, he just gave off this really genuine good vibe of being a good person just wanting good things for everybody. He just happened to be a professional where he had to knock your ass out. Yeah. He'd knock and, your uh, face off, but make sure you're okay. Exactly. Like he was compassionate about it. He would knock you out and then he would sit there and pat you ahead and just tell you everything was going to be good, which it would be usually, <laughs> you know? You're just fighting the legend. It's all good. Things happen like that. So he fight, you know, he ends up having an absolute war with Andy Gannigan, another wild fighter from that era who I, I mean the hardcore fighters definitely remember him and like and nostalgia wise. And his tapes are easily when you watch back on them, they're easily watchable, meaning like the action on them are just awesome. But Arguello comes off comes off the deck against him, ends up stopping him. Mm-hmm. And Pre fight interviews are great, dude, because they're like, Andy, what are you going to be bringing? He's like, ha 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 ha. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm just going <laughs> to go in there and fight him. I mean, I'm going to, you know, he's like the most he's laid from- back Hawaiian fucking guy you can imagine. And then goes in there and just like, let's fucking, let's duke it, buddy. Well, I mean, that's what he was. I was about to say he's from Hawaii. So obviously he's just kind of chill and not giving a shit about nothing. Right. Yeah. And unfortunately, he actually wound up getting killed a handful of years ago after getting like attacked in some bar or something like that in Hawaii. I read about that. Yeah. Unfortunately. And so, you know, rest his soul. But man, he was a he was a fun fighter and wildly popular in Hawaii during this time, too. And I I mean, he was a really fun fighter to watch. I mean, like I said, all of his OG Hawaiian punch. He knocked the hell out of poor Sean O'Grady. Jesus. But, um, yeah, he was, he was, yeah, he, you know, saw, not super skilled, but just a heavy puncher, a good body puncher and somebody you didn't really want to fuck around with. And, and he was go- a southpaw too. So like, mm-hmm. if you want to, if you want to kind of compare him to somebody, think of featherweight Pacquiao, junior featherweight Pacquiao for that matter. Like when he first kind of came on the scene and everything he had was just a straight left hand and that was it. Southpaw punchers are a nightmare. Yeah. That's kind of how Andy Gannigan was. Like, Gannigan wasn't a guy that was going to wow you with just out-and-out skill. But he was explosive. He had fast hands. And he had absolute fucking murderous power in that left hand. I mean, think about this. He was a lightweight who iced... um, Jeez, what's his name? Uh, Curtis Ramsey. Hardcore people out there remember his name. Curtis Ramsey was a middleweight, by the way. All right. That would go on to fight the likes of John Mugabe and a bunch of others and go the distance with a number of them, too, besides Mugabe. And Gannigan stopped him in, I think, what, like a round or two when they fought early on. So, yeah, not somebody anyways, to play with. Never. So, anyways, he, you know, he stops Gannigan and then he scores uh, what's become a highlight real knockout over the years over our future Mike Tyson trainer, Kevin Rooney. <laughs> it kind of dip. That's a hell of a way to dip your toe into the waters at 140 pounds. And now, granted, like, with all due respect, like Kevin Rooney already looked like me with his hairline, you know, in that knockout, bro. He was, that fool was, he was thinning. And even though he was only 19 and one at that point, like, it, it felt like he had lived a lot of life or something. And he was basically at the end of his boxing, his pro boxing career when this, hap- this happened. It wound up being, you know, just about the end. But I mean, it's about as picture perfect, textbook, classic, whatever you want to call it, a one two knockout as you could get. Just yeah. bap, 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 bap. Like, holy shit. And not only that, too, it's like, I always felt like that peekaboo style would just kind of work for short, stocky guys, but like Tyson and Patterson. And not for a guy at 140 like Rooney, who was just a little bit more lankier and not built like that. And when you see the fight and you see him holding his hands trying to do that shit, like, yeah, like, it's, you know, I don't it's, know. It's like if you're shorter, you don't have to move as much. But if you're taller, it's a lot to fold down. Yeah. You know, exactly. and it's like, that's not a good. Don't and then, you know, Arguello might have caught the like the number sequences when he was to go seven, eight. 24, 11. Blah, blah. <laughs> he's like, okay, here's a one, two. Bop, bop. <laughs> like, yeah. It Get fancy. Here's a fucking jab in the right hand. Yeah. But that banks him into um, you know, what he ends up getting the most known for, his big fight with Aaron Pryor. So 
It's really unfortunate because, like, we've already talked for a few minutes. This is he had an entire career before these fights, but these are what he winds up getting remembered for. And obviously, the crowning achievement for Aaron Pryor in his career, uh, who, you know, in my opinion, no issue with Pryor, but he winds up getting a little overrated overall. Um, But still, an absolute war, one of the greatest fights of the 1980s, no question. Just damn if it doesn't have to be fucking tainted by the goddamn bottle. And Panama Lewis in general, you know, we'll never yeah, just really just a not know. good dude. Not good dude. Not at all, man. You know, we'll never really know what was in that bottle. And it's interesting in the sense that, like, Pryor has talked about it. Pryor did talk about it in years afterwards. I mean, he never really, like, had a full-on sit-down discussion and, like, went detail by detail about what went on that night or anything. But, like... He kind of skirted and it was like, oh, you know, schnapps or is this or that or something. And then we've heard from others too, like the the documentary that ended up happening on um the tragic Billy Collins fight. And people know about that. That was when Luis Resto, the night that Duran fought on, was it Davey Moore? Davey Moore, yeah. Yeah, on the undercard of that, Luis Resto fought an up and coming hot prospect called Billy Co- named Billy Collins. And Collins ends up, you know, suffering like permanent damage to his face. Well, from what we found out, it was like padless gloves that Panama Lewis took out. And in the subsequent documentary, decades later, when they're chronicling it, um, Resto mentions that Lewis would take um, what, like asthma spray, like the the yeah, container. He said it was asthma, like like tablets, and like yeah, dissolve something. them in the water. Yeah, and dissolve them in the water, and you take that, and you just kind of like, holy shit, you know, it make you whatever who really knows what it was but it was one of those fights that like it it was just the most it was besides the besides the fact of the controversy of everything with it it's just one of the most brilliant fights you'll ever see and there's a reason why people call it the fight of the 80s and for me it just depends on which one you rather watch like either it's bazooka lamon bobby chacon four or that one just do a toss-up because they're both incredible in their own sense but like Arguello and Pryor, you know, Arguello was one of those guys. He's moving up to uh, win a championship in the fourth division. Pryor, who's been scoundering and scraping since his pro debut for any type of respect and anything he can get, took him forever to finally get to the point where he was of this fight. And a guy that's still thinking he's not getting any respect, he gets even more incensed before the fight because the announcer announces Arguello as Mr. Alexis Arguello and just announces Pryor as Aaron Pryor. So now he's even more like, what the fuck? I want to hurt this guy. And they just, it it was like, you know, fire and ice. You know what I mean? Like the beginning, it's prior coming in like a fucking windmill, just blah, 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 perpetual motion. And Arguello is like overwhelmed and he finally comes down and he comes back and the countering and the back and forth. And, but the only thing again, like, you know, you're watching all this brilliance and then you're just wondering though, how can Pryor take this type of punishment? He's taking some shots that just like, it makes absolutely no sense. And especially near the late rounds, like it's really close now. We're talking like round 10, round 11. And like, I think it was like round 12 or so, Arguello unloads a right hand that just would knock out anybody, even a heavyweight, right? Hits him with his right hand and Pryor's head just looks up in into the sky. And then he just backs up like two feet and then goes back to throwing again. I, at that point, it was as good as over because like when you hit someone with that, and they just eat that. And I don't know if it was whatever he was drinking on that bottle to help him eat that or not, but, <laughs> you know. They both hit each other with shots that would have knocked out pretty much anybody else that night. And, I mean, that's – but that's kind of one of the, the essences of what they fucking put together that night against each other um, and why it was one of the greatest fights of the 80s and also that it went 14 rounds kind of down to the wire – etc the bottle shit sucks but still a great fight unfortunately there were a number of fights in the 1980s that either ended tragically or had some weird thing that kind of makes it feel strange to watch but they were still really fucking good um but yeah that's definitely one of them but i mean even so dude after that loss which which was his first loss in a title fight in a while um, you know, our way goes on to fight Vilamar Fernandez a few a few months after that. Who Vilamar Fernandez was a damn good fighter in and of itself, in and of himself. So it's like, you know, the dude didn't stop. He like never stopped challenging himself. 
No, he beats Fernandez in a rematch because Fernandez like outpointed them shockingly a few years before that. And in the prior rematch, I mean, ugh, that by that point, look, I mean, I don't know. Obviously, the first prior fight took something out of, out of Arguello. Clearly did. That was a brutal knockout, too. Because when you mentioned, like, you know, in the 80s, a lot of tragedies and things happened. And initially, people were scared that something had happened to Arguello, too. Because if you watch that knockout, I, like, it's it's bad. You know, prior, like, Arguello has nothing going on left in round 14, and you just see prior run to the ropes and boom, hips him with right hand after right hand after right hand, and Arguello's head is snapping back before the referee finally is like, oh, okay, now I'll step in. Yeah, he kind of, like, slides down yeah. and looks not good for a minute. And when he finally just goes and prior, and Arguello just slinks down unconscious there, and they had to put oxygen on him and everything. I mean, it's, it's a brutal. It's really, really brutal. And... Yeah, by the time he fights Pryor again, and it's crazy too, because when they have the rematch, Pryor now is in like the throws of crack cocaine. You know what I mean? Like he's his... yeah, he's been arrested a handful of times. He's yeah. he's gotten he got hit with the what's it called? Uh, sorry, back back child support. Yeah, like, oh yeah, like, yeah. His hardcore. life is absolute is just messed up. His life is messed up. He is going through it at this point, and but somehow just in the ring like a guy like johnny tapia they're able to just you know they find that one place of peace for themselves and he beat Arguello worse than they did in their first fight you know Arguello was competitive in spots but he got dropped in the first round he got dropped you know again like he got beat up throughout and when he finally gets dropped again in the last uh what was it round 10 that he got stopped yeah. in when he finally got dropped again around 10 and he sits there and no one else would see that type of like just despondent, you know what, it's over. Look, sent after, what was it, 89? Uh, um, over 20 years later when Eric Morales kind of did the same thing with Manny Pacquiao in their third fight, it's just sitting there and they're just kind of like, you know, that I'm moving. Yeah, what, you want me to get up and take more? Exactly. Like, Arguello just sat there and he just like accepted. He's like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, he just knew. And that was controversial oh. at the time. Yeah. And no one like, had really not yeah. super controversial, but people were bitching. Sure, but I mean like it wasn't in the sense of like a Duran no Moss where he just turned his back, it was like right, not right, yeah. like he was just beat up. What was the point of going on anymore where he knew he had nothing to give? It was yeah. gonna get worse. It was only round ten and there was a fifteen round fight too. So it was like what was he gonna do? Take five more rounds of an ass kicking that he didn't need to? Like and so that looked like it was going to be the end of it. But, I mean, he still had one more highlight of his career. He fights, you know, he comes back a couple of years later or whatever it was, and then he fights, um, uh, yeah, a few years later, in fact. He ends up fighting Billy Costello. And Billy Costello, former junior welterweight champion, who by the mid-'80s now, Pryor has completely faded away. Um, no, You know, the junior welterweight division at this point was like, it was kind of in a flux, you know what I mean? Like, dudes like Chavez... And Melger Taylor was still a year or two away from like really making their appearance on that division and like kind of bringing it to a whole new era. So once Pryor went off of that, like, you know, you had it was more or less middling. I mean, it was popular, but there was there was no like absolute stars. Right. And Costello was one of the first guys that looked like he had the potential to be one, like the way he came on the scene and he beat Leroy Haley for a belt. And then he um he beats Saul Mambe and he's made a couple other defenses and, you know, he's popular in the Kingston, New York area and New York area in general. And he has a good style, but once he gets shockingly knocked out by Lonnie Smith, he's kind of like, you know, thrown into a thing. So it's a crossroads fight. And for the first few rounds, Costello, cause he's younger and he's fresher and Arguello is clearly past it. He's beaten Arguello pretty comprehensively. It's not really close. you know. Yeah. He's beating him up and Arguello yeah, he, looks yeah, old. He, he looked really old. And like a lot of, you know, just kind of like, ah, shit, it's going to be one of those where if he doesn't get knocked out, he's going to lose a wide decision. But no, Arguello, you know, punchers always still got that punch in them. And Arguello, even though he's old, he still knew how to throw crisp punches. They weren't wild. And that's what he did with Costello. He still caught him, still had the power. Costello got caught. He got knocked out. <laughs> yeah, he caught him. And then like Costello like gets up and then he like, you know, just kind of swarms him and it gets stopped because it's uh, yeah. uh, Mills Lane because that shit was in Reno. And, you know, Mills Lane, he was usually a pretty on-point referee. Like, he had a couple flubs, but he was usually pretty on-point. And he was like, nah. Nah, 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 nah. That's over. And he was right. He was absolutely right. No, he was. And But, I mean, you know, the, the crazy thing was you said you call it a crossroads fight, and it was. 
but it was like after that Costello's, you know, he, he never really regained much form, but then our Arguello, it was a clear indicator to him that he was like, dude, if I'm getting beaten up for three rounds and having to pull it out of the fire against Billy Costello, I get me get the fuck out of here. And he yeah. retired again, you know, temp uh, temporarily, unfortunately, like it always is. But, um, but that was, you know, effectively the end of his career. Uh, just like everybody we've mentioned before, Pinche George Foreman, bro, fucking getting everybody to come out of retirement in the late eighties and early nineties, or at least and every to division. every division. Fuck, George, what are you doing? But it worked for George. Hey, Damn, yeah. we're gangbusters yeah. for that guy. <laughs> and Arguello, after his career ended, because there's no reason to even talk about those last two fights, unless someone wants to hear the name Scott Pink Locker. But um. <laughs> Arguello became a staple at the Hall of Fame, and him and Pryor were always a staple to being known together because they were very friendly. Arguello was the most friendliest person on the planet. Pryor, after he overcame his addictions and, you know, the dark period in his life, became a really popular figure at the Hall of Fame, too, and they were always chummy and buddy-buddy together. You know what I mean? You can always catch them together. And I was lucky enough to meet Arguello a number of times over the years at the Hall of Fame, and he was just what you got on TV again. It, there was nothing fake or pretentious or putting on an act or anything like that. Like he was just the most genuinely sweet human being you could possibly meet. Just an absolute gentleman, just a class act, you know, but you know, when you found out when, you know, the tragedy struck in what was it? Oh, nine, which was just an awful summer as it was because of him. It's guy a stretch. Vernon forest all in this matter of a couple of months or whatever it was. Um, you know, the Arguello thing, I just, I always say, I think I've told this story before on the podcast, but like I said, I used to see Arguello at the Hall of Fame all the time. And, um, you know, when they talked about how he took himself out and he was going through a lot of issues, drug related and depression and all kinds of other stuff he had dealing with himself. You know, I remember seeing him there and he was always just super jovial. Like anyone that wanted to approach him, he'd be very polite and friendly and shake your hand, give you a hug, want to talk, you know, he would give you a few minutes if you really want to talk to him, whatever it may be. And we were always at Graziano's and like, you know, you would see him there. And one time, for whatever reason, he was by himself. He was sitting at a table by himself and like no one was around him. And I remember looking at him and he just had the saddest look you could imagine on somebody's face. Like clearly he was thinking about something and it was just brief though it wasn't like you know i don't i don't know how long he was thinking like that but he just had a really really sad look on his face and i just remember looking at him and then like somebody approached him and he snapped out of it like immediately but like you know and went about his business but i just will never forget that face like you can just clearly see something was troubling him i'm not saying that whatever it was is what led to anything or nothing but i just know that like that was a look of a person that clearly had like stuff going on in his life you know got into politics yeah in a country where getting into politics can get you killed um and that's not to talk badly about nicaragua at all a lot of the issues that are going on in nicaragua now are fueled by the u.s and we're in the past as well so i that's you know i don't want to shit on the country at all uh just to make that clear but he got into politics in a country where that can get you killed um, and so it was especially at a, at a very tumultuous time from the seventies through the nineties, especially, but then it also kind of kicked back up in the two thousands. Um, Arguello had gotten, and I don't want to get into the details. I know a little bit about them, but there's no point. Point is that there's a lot of dispute as to what exactly happened with his death. Was it him? Was it, you know, political opponents or, you know, uh, sending a message or something like that? Nobody knows. Um, and I'm certainly not going to speculate because I don't know, but it was definitely part of a fucked up summer. And it, I can only say that when it comes to that, nobody knows what anybody else is going through. And so, especially for somebody who doesn't really know somebody else, Man, nobody fucking knows, bro. You know, yeah. like it's it's you don't know what anybody's going through. So in any case, uh the larger point, obviously, when it comes to the show is that he lost his uh pro debut according to what we had known for like decades, and recent research seems to contra contradict that, but incredibly great fighter, fun to talk about, beloved fighter for sure. And just an absolute class human and 
when you think of people that you'd like want to represent the sport of boxing and all that, like you can't think of one person. I never called him a channel, but that's always the first name. That's always the first word that came out to people. And you'd be like, oh, Alexis, yeah, what a sweetheart. What a gentleman. Fighter, they would say gentleman. How many people can you say about that in the sport of boxing in history? Oh, you know, so-and-so was a gentleman. <laughs> yeah, especially if they've been in it for a while. You know what I mean? <laughs> That shit sours you like a motherfucker for sure. I don't even want to be known as a gentleman. I ain't no goddamn gentleman. <laughs> yeah, I'm like intentionally not a gentleman. I'm yeah. Like, fuck you. Get the fuck out of my face. <laughs> oh, gentleman. Get the fuck out of here, gentleman. But yeah. he uh, he fit the term, you know, for and sure. like probably did. It wasn't like an act for him. So okay, but yeah. Well, I'm gonna bring up another guy who I mean we can't really go through his career because that would be like a several fucking show series. But nonetheless, uh, he has a serious argument for being the greatest fighter of all time for extremely obvious reasons, his ledger being one of them, but also an extremely important stat of holding the featherweight, lightweight, and welterweight championship simultaneously, which is never going to be done again, of course, yeah. and came somewhat close to holding the middleweight championship also at the same time, but... I'll get to that in a minute. There's a little bit of mythology attached to that part, but that it doesn't, you know, it's still impressive. It doesn't have to be anyway, hammer and Hank Armstrong, Henry Armstrong, one of the greatest fighters of all time, lost his professional fucking debut, bro. But look at what he went on to do. Holy crap. And yeah, absolutely. And what's interesting about Armstrong is that, like I said, in the beginning of the show, he didn't turn pro as Henry Armstrong, but he turned pro under a surname. That name, Melody Jackson, right? Yep. Yeah. Like many third, fighters have done throughout the years. Sure. And with a third round KO loss to one Al, what was his name? Al Ivano. I, how do you pronounce that shit? Ivano? Iovano, I guess. Yeah. Iovano. Yeah. There you go. Something like that. But yeah. yeah um, I guess this also goes to what we were talking about earlier with like, you know, it just being far more common you're going to fight what three times this month or five times over the you know six <laughs> months or something like that. You know, if you lost whatever, it doesn't matter who gives a shit, you know, you'll still get booked to fight next month. So especially in the 1930s and forties, I think people just, uh, unless they're aware, they just don't quite understand the popularity of boxing coming off the 1920s and how many fighters were registered at, as professional fighters it's like the the numbers are like astronomical, dude. It was like mm -hmm. in the hundreds of thousands or something. It was something fucking wild and crazy uh, during this time period. And so there were just fights all over. You go look on BoxRec and when you search by date or venue, it's just like event, 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 like all over the fucking place all the time in the 1930s and 40s. It was pretty fucking crazy. What wound up stopping it, of course, was World War II and the U.S. getting involved in World War II put like a really big halt on it. Um, but a number of fighters served and also fought as they served or fought, uh, you know, between service or whatever. Henry Armstrong was one of them. Uh, but I mean, yeah, just absolutely fucking amazing career. Dude, he's one of those guys that like, you know, when I first learned about him as a kid, I didn't see footage of him. I just saw photos and like cartoons and stuff like that. And they were explaining it. And, you know, when they talked about him being a human windmill and stuff, like I didn't really know what they were. I'm like, okay, that sounds interesting. But then you see the way he's built and then you would see photos of his fights and like stills of him. And just by going off the stills, I would almost get the sense that I could kind of tell by the style they were talking about. Because he didn't look like the traditional sense where he's sitting there with hands up and like doing, you know, anything like that. Like a lot of them were him coming in and like waiting with some shit or just like, you know, doing like coming in like a windmill. You know what I mean? Like it looked like he was on some pressure thing where he was about to overwhelm, overwhelm somebody with like a double fisted sandwich of awfulness. <laughs> That's exactly what it was back then. Like he was, you know, just a, a freak of nature. And it took a little while. He lost his first few pro fights. You know what I mean? He had to, like, develop that. And this is back in the early 30s, like you said, where guys like this, they were thrown to the wolves and they were matched competitively. And if you lost a handful of fights on the way up, that wasn't a big deal. You know what I mean? We, they all did. Only the very few exceptions, uh, you know, a prodigy like Sugar Ray Robinson or Willie Pepper stuff were the exceptions where they were able to weed through the competition, sometimes have a draw here and there or a split decision. But 
for the most part, remain unscathed. Guys like Armstrong and others, not so much, you know. And as you move through, and Armstrong, who had probably the longest chapter in uh, Phil Berger's In This Corner, the guy wouldn't stop fucking yapping. Even as a kid, I remember reading that and getting like overwhelmed saying like, you know, he was talking way too much about religion and a bunch of other stuff he was going on about. But he ends up, I remember in his book, he ended up talking about this, um, the uh, series of fights he had with the legendary Mexican, um, uh, what was it? Um, Baby Arismendi? Baby Arismendi, yeah. Yeah, yeah so. fellow, are you talking about his uh, gloves? glory and god book no 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 and phil berger's in this corner the you know the oh, oh yeah 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 yeah. Oh, okay yeah he interviewed armstrong in that book and there was like i remember as a kid each page each time there was the interview when like the berger not Bill, not phil berger um peter heller excuse yeah, me yeah 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 in the peter heller book each but at the end of it when he would do the interview each guy only had like a couple two or three pages you know what i mean to talk about maybe a couple of that four so Armstrong had like fucking nine pages devoted to his chapter. He just wouldn't stop talking. <laughs> it will at, at one point in the, I think it was like the late fifties and early sixties, he became a preacher like a, or like a minister in LA. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, I think he became a talker <laughs> for sure. sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, just incredible guy. And early on though, like I said, he had to go through a fucking ringer. Well, uh, I think that something a lot of people might might discount about Ray Robinson is that, yeah, like he he definitely had uh, they kind of kept his O intact. A lot of that was the fact that he had a lot of money backing him. Um, mm -hmm. And that's not to say that he was the first fighter that ever had a lot of money backing him. But he was an amateur star and well known as an amateur. And by the time he turned pro, he already had a bit of a crowd. Uh, and they had promoted him and managed him very, very well. And that's actually what winds up being even more impressive about Ray Robinson is that they managed him so carefully and he still fought all those fucking names. That's what's fucking crazy. But nonetheless, uh, your point earlier was that Henry Armstrong didn't have that kind of backing. He had to go through the fucking ringer. And you look at a lot of the contenders or even like kind of like mid or lower level contenders who might not have been top level, but were just hard fucking mean bastards that he had to go through. Uh, and also as a fairly small uh, featherweight who was still growing too, like he was not a big featherweight whatsoever. He wasn't a tall guy in general. And so, you know, he was going through a lot of these uh, other fighters, even uh, former flyweight midget Wolgast, he winds up getting, yep. uh, getting a win over. But the only fighters who wound up uh, beating him twice, Baby Arzmendi, like you said, Fritzy Zivic, no shame in losing to Fritzy Zivic. And then a little bit later on in his career, Lou Ambers, who again, no shame, great lightweight himself. But other than that, you know, the the losses, the bad losses, you know, apart from the early ones, basically Ray Robinson, uh, you know, needless to say, no shame losing to Ray Robinson, Bo Jack. You know and what I mean? Like past his prime too. Even when he lost to Zivic and he lost the welterweight crown to Zivic, he was already past it at that point. And if you watch Armstrong in his in his prime, though, like by the time he was rampaging through, like you said, he ends up finally getting a win over Aris Mendy. Um, he ends up, uh, he beats Midget Wallagas. He ends up stopping probably the ancient Benny Bass by 19, you know, in the late 30s. And Benny Bass is, you know, former champion and long all Hall of Famer, everything like that. But by the time they get together, I mean, the guy's had over two over 200 fights. Like, you know, the fuck is he going to do with Armstrong besides take a beating? So Armstrong finally gets a title shot against the very, very tough P.D. Saren, who first time me seeing him in photos i just thought he looked like george the animal steel yeah because, he looks you know, he looks scary he's like the hairiest dude who ever existed exactly too. you know i mean he has a he looks like 126 pound george the animal steel he has a super receding hairline i mean imagine steel being in like round up. nine against that guy jesus oh, christ that's the same thing about like um the middleweight champ marcel till you know the <laughs> yeah. dude like that like my biggest weirdest thing to me for whatever reason would be like if i'm boxing and round nine, I got a sweaty, super body hair dude all over me with his shoulders all up in my... Nah. I'm yeah, just gonna there's those fighters who said they used to go into the ring intentionally smelling. Bro. Yeah, nah, I'm like, good. Nah, I'm dude. I'm keeping good, you at the bro. end of my jab tonight, bro. <laughs> uh. <laughs>
And but I mean, like Saren was another dude who had way over a hundred wins in his career, a long time credible champion, and Armstrong just rampaged him. And um I don't know, was that the same card? Was that one of those tournament of champions that they tried putting on? Where like he beat Saren and then Till lost to somebody, uh, like Till lost to Apostoli. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not sure. I know that he was on one of those cards, I know, but I don't I know. know if that was it. I can tell you if that was the shit. Dude, he he basically um, ran through, uh, you know, between not so much at welterweight. Uh, I wasn't, I wasn't. All right, wrong card. But you go ahead. He didn't he didn't run through welterweight quite as much, but he definitely ran through featherweight and lightweight. I mean, no, that's not true. He ran through welterweight too. No, he ran through all. Oh, three. What, was the, what was the record that he had for like defenses in a year or something? Oh my gosh, dude! It's probably or being just, like, like the upper like, teens, I, mean, I would imagine. Yeah, or not not in a year, but that, overall. No, there's the stat that he fought. I forgot how many fights it was in the year, and he was undefeated. And I don't know it off the top of my head, but I know that there were like three separate months where he defended the title like at least twice. <laughs> sure. But what's fascinating, too, another fascinating fact about Armstrong is that, like, after he beats Saren, it's not like he moves up to lightweight. He moves up to welterweight after that first to fight Barney Ross, correct? Yeah, he skipped around. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he skipped to fight Barney Ross. And Barney Ross, again, is another champion that was obviously at the very end of his career. But, argue, you know, not even arguable. Definitely in the top 12 of pound for pound, the best fighters in history, I would say. Just beautiful guy. If you watch footage of him today, it holds up. I mean, more than holds up. He was just brilliant. And under the tutelage of Ray Arcel, like, you couldn't find a better guy. He had a fucking chin of titanium. You weren't going to knock him out. His skills were just impeccable. And... Everything about him was just a great fighter. But, I mean, he had a long career at that point. And by the time he fought Armstrong, who was absolutely peaking, it was going to be tough for him. And um, he took a beating in that fight, took an absolute fucking pasting. And by the end, it was one of those that people were kind of like begging, stop it, stop it. But Ross wouldn't let it be stopped. And Arcel had a loyalty to him, wouldn't stop it, even though he wanted to. And um, Armstrong ends up getting the decision, easy decision. But, I mean, he just beats him. And there's clips of that fight. You can just watch it and you just kind of pummel him in the corner. And the way they like that old footage, you know how they kind of accentuate the punches a little bit to make them sound even more doom, 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 like that? And they were doing that and it just makes it, it sounds like he's beating on a drum. But after the fight, Arcel said in, um, in many accounts, after he was interviewed talking about that over the years, he would say that Ross's wife, was trying to rush the the dressing room in the hotel after trying to get to him to Barney, and Arcel wouldn't let him in, wouldn't let her in because she didn't want her she didn't want uh, her to see him like that. And that he said he put you know he took care of him and nursed him like a baby that night. He said that he put towels all over his face, you know, hot this and that. He made him take a bath and then like slept with him and everything. And wouldn't let his wife in until like two days later when he felt it was sufficient enough that she would be able to see him again. <laughs> The old trainers were fucking weird, bro. Making their own <laughs> yeah. little concoctions they'd carry around in a medicine bag. Could have said he did, bro. You know? Yeah. But, I mean, that was the type of beating that he put on him. Ross never fought again. And then, so now he's welterweight and featherweight champion. What else is he going to do? All right. Well, he's going to go down to lightweight. And who's residing down there is tough as nails, Lou Ambers. Absolute, you know, fucking little menace himself. And, um... Armstrong and Ambers proceed to have one of the most brutal fights imaginable for the lightweight championship. And brutal in the sense that, like, Armstrong suffers one of the most gnarly cuts in history and inside his mouth. Like, it's a mouth cut. And, like, mouth cuts are the absolute worst. You know, when you see a dude fucking, like, get his lip shredded in a fight, you're like, you gag immediately because it's visible. You know, seeing a lip just kind of dangle or an inside lip cut, um, Notable examples would be um, Jorge Barrios, right, against Juarez, where he got caught with a punch and his lip just kind of... Or um, Corrales. Yeah, Corrales against, against uh, Casamayor in their first fight, right? It was that mouthpiece or whatever that just sliced the shit out of him. Yeah, and then they gave him water, and he just goes, Bleh, and it, like, comes uh, out yeah, the hole Yeah, 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 like, thanks. I just, I Christ, just, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and, and well and to his credit they're like you know margaret goodman's like all right all right that's it and he's like nah give me another round i'm like i remember round. i remember fucking another round of fucking shots are you fucking kidding me 
No, there's nothing more worse than just seeing like that the the the, the lip dangle shit, bro. That's just so fucking bad. For me, Lennox bro. Lewis immediately Klitschko, like when he's talking yeah, in the interview yeah. afterward. <laughs> I just remember being like, uh. So Armstrong didn't suffer an outer lip issue like that. Not so much that was like there, but it was inside his mouth. You can and, see it in the photos because he's in all of them. His mouth is wide open. Yeah. And how much? How much did they say he swallowed? I don't remember, but it's some disgusting amount. Like, what's more, a pint or a quart? A quart. I don't even. A uh, quart. Yeah, I don't think he. I don't think he swallowed a quart of blood. That yeah, seems... no. That if he lost a quart of blood, that'd be bad. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I don't think that was that much. I don't whatever it was though, it was like a certain amount of like he swallowed a lot of blood enough that he was puking in the corner because of it. And, and these days they'd stop that fight. They would stop that in a minute. That's, they would if no like chance. vomiting in the quarters, like an automatic stoppage these days. Mm -hmm. It's been like that for years. Yep. Uh you know, this is the 1930s and things were just different back then. As people would say, when men were men, you know. Or we were not a proper country. We were Back proper when we country. could watch guys get killed on TV. Yeah. yeah. But despite that cut, Armstrong, you know, rallies and scores a comprehensive de uh, decision over Ambers. And there is a pretty, I don't know if it's famous or not, but there's a pretty gnarly photo that I have in the uh, history of boxing book that um, Nat Fleischer and Sam Andre did, where Armstrong, after the fight, is... It looks like he's wearing a suit too, which is just like ridiculous. And he's in surgery. Like he's he's uh he's getting stitches up and you see tears coming down his eye. While like, you know, the the surgeon is like whatever they're doing. Cause I can't imagine, you know, that primitive style type shit they were doing by the late thirties <laughs> to close up a lip in your mouth. Jesus. Yeah, they're just like, all right, now think good thoughts. Yeah, right. <laughs> Just yeah, that he's now a simultaneous um three time you know three division champion. What's what's even perhaps the craziest thing about it is all this shit that we're talking about. The vast majority of it is concentrated into about three years, nineteen thirty seven to nineteen forty, and he like his career like went down pretty quickly. Like you know he he didn't have a ton of longevity overall. I mean, well look. With a style like that, and I mean, with a pace like that, when you're fighting so many fights a year, it's only going to add up to just like eventually everything's going to fall apart for you. You know what I mean? I don't, he was known for having like the most ridiculous stamina too. And I think it was because like, like he had a slow heart, he had some kind of heart rate that was different than anyone else's, right? They said. And something like that. Yeah. yeah. Somebody said they clocked him at like he was like 30 something or 40 something, which is really low. Yeah. But, it's the sense that just like, you know, a guy like him, he he can only just go so far like that, you know, and then eventually things are going to catch up to you. And he almost though still before that happened. I mean, he almost became a fucking four top four division champion, four different divisions. Now, think about this, too. There were only eight divisions in boxing back then. Armstrong potentially had a chance to own four of them, which is insane. <laughs> yeah, like there were. Oh, like there were junior divisions, but they didn't count them the same way. And a lot of writers straight up dismissed them at this point. Sure. Um, and I mean, like he came pretty damn close. He had dropped the uh, featherweight title <laughs> by the time yeah. he almost won the, I think it was like the, the California version of the middleweight title. So like, you know, there's some technicalities there, but even so uh, Seferino Garcia was not far from holding a portion of the actual middleweight title and had uh, Armstrong been able to claim a victory over him, which was pretty close because they declared it a draw, it would have warranted most likely a shot at least a portion of the actual middleweight title. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is, dude, the middleweight title during this time, I'm... it was fucked up. Like, there were a lot of different claims here and there. So, you know, it's unfortunate that it would, there was a lot of asterisks there. But regardless, he still wound up defeating Seferino Garcia later on. He did. So, like, he beat Garcia, I think, by, what was it? Did he beat him for the welterweight championship by decision? Like, in a title defense? I think, I think so, what... yeah. But, so, when he fought Garcia for the middleweight, though, I mean, like you said, that division was completely fucked by the mid-30s, like, with different climate um, and and all this other stuff. But, I think, I want to say, Garcia probably had the strongest hold at that point, too, because he knocked out, um, was it Apostoli? Mm -hmm. Yep. 
and possibly was kind of generally recognized as being the man of that division, even though there was other, you know, people claiming the whole portion of it, whatever. So, like, he was generally recognized as being that dude. And I think if Armstrong had won that, most people would have skirted anything, but like, no, no, he's the champ just because of what it would represent too and be easy to say that and like the history surrounding that, you know? They would, you know, and anyone else that would be there during that time, which Marcel Till had been knocked out by Apostoli, so he was off the, off the radar. And um, I know Freddie Steele was there and other stuff like that, but like, no, everyone would have been like, no, no, I'm strong, I'm strong, I'm strong. And rightfully so, because he was the star at that point. He was one of the biggest names in the sport. And for him to pull off a crazy feat like that would have, Easily, everyone has been like, nah, let's not forget anyone else. Let's just, boom, go with this because of what it represented, you know? And which but, which would have been pretty wild, you know? Even if, even if it didn't line up that he had all four at the same time, to hold all four in such a short period of time, that would have been, it already is wild. Three yeah. is wild. Four would have been fucking insane. I mean, at that point, people are just going to be like, hey, man, yeah, throw him in with Joe Lewis. <laughs> you know, like, who knows? Even but, now with everything that's happened since, people still, there are people who still say he's the greatest of all time. And it's like, what are you going to argue? No, I mean, totally get it. He's certainly in the discussion. Absolutely in the discussion. But, um, so, you know, eventually, though, it starts unraveling for him. And when he fights Fritzy Zivic, who's generally recognized, if not the most he has to be the dirtiest fighter in history. I don't know. He's if he's not, he's one A or one B. All right. He's he's un- up there. He's up there. <laughs> there's unfortunately no footage of it, of really of him. I mean, there's like the grainiest of green, uh, at least of what's on YouTube. I don't know. Maybe some of those collectors that are always hoarding this shit have something that we don't know about. But um, he's just one of those guys that like throughout lore, everybody from all because Zivic. Even though out of all the world champions in boxing history, especially like legit ones, he has won the worst records of them. Like he had over 60 losses. But if you look at his resume, he probably has from top to bottom, one of the top, one of the best resumes in boxing history. The dude literally fought anybody. Yep. He did not give a fuck. He from fought anybody, to anytime, any place, just... anywhere, didn't care. <laughs> like... You know, and one of the few guys back in that era, too, who, I mean, the color line wasn't really a drawn thing as much as it was in the early portion of the century, but none of these guys were going out of their way to fight Black Murderers Row, obviously, in anything or any of those type of guys in Zivic. He didn't fight all of them because they're, you know, very fought a number of them, though. Yeah, but he fought Charlie Burley, he fought all these other dudes. Like, he didn't give a fuck. Like, you wanted to throw him in there, and Zivic was like, yeah, sure, I'm down for it, <laughs> you know. And with all the fights that he had, Obviously, he develops himself. You know, it's just a tough ass brawler, Croatian brawler menace from um, from Pittsburgh. Like a nice little repertoire of um, of uh, usages for you know for fouls to the point where he can make guys lose their mind. For example, um, Al Bummy Davis. Right, Al Bummy Davis is one of those guys from that era. Another rough and tumble brawler who had a monster left hook, but limited boxing skills, and was popular for the time. And um, would suffer a very, you know, sad ending in itself. But during his prime, that dude was a medicine himself, right? <laughs> and in the first fight with Zivic, the first fight he had with Zivic, they were going at it. Zivic, you know, they get into a clinch. Apparently, Zivic hits him low. Davis starts getting a little rumbly. They go over. Zivic starts hitting him in the kidneys. Davis is getting a little more annoyed. And then Zivic starts, like, waking him in the eyes and doing shit until Zivic, Davis finally says, fuck it, you really want to go like this? Let's go. <laughs> and charges at them. He gets disqualified and a riot breaks out in the entire arena. Like, that's the type of stuff Zivic would do to people, you know? So a guy like Armstrong, who was really inside of you and, like, brawling and everything like that, that would be in Zivic's wheelhouse, you know? And, For a dude and, who could use his elbows and thumbs and other delectables. And the hilarious shit about it was that Zivic, by pretty much all accounts, was a really nice dude. Just like a, a working class, like, every guy... You know, uh, he looked normal when he was younger, but then along the way, I can't remember what fight it was off the top of my head. I have it somewhere, but not the fight itself, but what fight it was. But one fight, he got his nose broken real badly, and it never healed right after that. And then so he is one of the worst fucking broken noses that you'd ever see. <laughs> like go If you go look at uh, photos from when he was younger and then photos from a few years later, it's like, Ugh, holy shit, that's what boxing does to you. But by all accounts, he was a super nice dude uh, and just a kind of regular guy, 
kind of a matter of fact type of guy, told a lot of jokes, et cetera. But then like if like he said uh, later on, I can't remember what book it was, but he said something to the effect of former opponents would used to come up to him and they'd like not so much confront him, but they'd be like, so what's all that? What was all that business about your, you know, why were you fucking thumbing the shit out of me? Why were you lacing me? Why were you elbowing me? You know, like, and he said it was usually his thumb. Like it was low blows at his thumb that he, that he used to, cause they didn't have the attached thumbs and the fucking gloves back then. And you could kind of, you know, and uh, he said they used to say some shit and that he would just basically joke it off. That's what everybody said. Everybody would be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so I gave you the thumb, you know, ha ha ha, you know, type of shit. And it was like, no, dude, you really actually fucked my eyes up, bro. I can't see now. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Like um, Henry Armstrong said that he fucked his eyes up real bad at one point during one of their fights and that he like, you know, couldn't see for a few rounds and stuff like that. The guy was a menace. An absolute well, menace. He, he really was, man. And like a guy like Burley never talked good about him. He always said that that was one of the dirtiest fighters and nastiest ones he had to fight. And there's that famous photo of him. I don't know if it's after their fight. Probably is because like this would make sense. But he fought Billy Khan and almost beat him. And like he, I know he broke Khan's nose and did other various things to him. And there's a photo of them where they're sitting like ringside and Khan has like a giant bandage over his nose and other stuff. And you see Zivik pointing and laughing. Yeah. Zivik's like making fun of him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, there's, there's another post fight too. one of the fights where uh, he fought Lamada, the one where he beat him and mm -hmm. they're standing there post fight and Zivik's like shaking his hand and Lamada looks like he just got run through a meat grinder. He's like, <laughs> like, like poor fucking guy, dude. And he was a welterweight and fucking Lamada is like a massive fucking middleweight, dude. Like beat his ass. Yeah, man. Mass. I would never want to fight a guy like Zivic. Absolutely not. Fuck no. <laughs> Whatever they're paying you, it ain't enough. Yeah, seriously. So yeah, he loses uh his welterweight crown to Zivic, gets stopped in a rematch. He eventually beats Zivic in the third fight, but it's just, you know, he's already passed it. And then when he fights Ambers in a in a rematch for the lightweight crown, by like you said, that by this time featherweight time's been long gone. Um that was one of those fights that like Ambers beat him, but Armstrong controversially lost like five five pounds, like five rounds or so, or something from the referee over low blows. Like something really weird happened in that fight, you know? And yeah. it just kind of cost him. But whatever it was, he ends up losing the, you know, he ends up losing a rematch to um to Ambers, loses the lightweight championship. And like that's I mean, like he still had a long career, don't get me wrong. Like he beat everybody and anyone you could think of, but like by the time now, like by the by the time the uh, the late thirties and early forties are on the are on the thing coming up and stuff like that, like he's still beating dudes like Sammy Yanga and you know having other wins. But by the time he ends up fighting um, Robinson forty three, like he's past it. Like he's completely past it. And that was more so Robinson thought of Armstrong as one of his heroes and wanted to give him a payday and help him out as opposed to like. Oh, this is like you know a passing of the torch. He didn't really want to go in there or hurt Armstrong. He didn't want to do yeah. nothing. It was just using his name to get a you know boost his career yeah. basically, which is uh, no sh shit talk. It's it's what's always happened to yeah. throughout history. Um, but yeah, it was it was he was in like his eleventh year or something like that as a pro. So it's not like he was you know uh, super old, but just to illustrate how much he had gotten done in such a short period of time. That at that point he was he was done. They had already recognized him as an old pro, a veteran who was on his way out, type of thing. And it's not like he was totally got his ass kicked against Robinson either. Ray Robinson still knew that he couldn't really mess around. You know, he was he, he was giving him the payday, but he couldn't mess around. He's you know, it's it's one of those fights that like because Armstrong still had a career after the Robinson fight. I'm not gonna be like, okay, he fought Robinson, then it was done. He still had a number of fights after that with a couple of good wins, but this was, you know, in terms of just knowing he wasn't going to reach the top anymore. Yeah, those are one of those type of fights. Like when you watch Roy Jones, when he boxed Mike McCallum, he never really took a chance against him, but he was clearly in control the whole time. Exactly. Or like other like fights like that, or like guys, they're not going to go out of their way to try to like knock out the guy because they're a legend and they can still pull out a trick or two, but they're not going to lose a round either. It was just, you know, kind of a redundant, boring decision. So. Yeah, and, and I mean a damn good name on Ray Robinson's resume, too. Not like he was just some old nobody. 
Absolutely. I mean, that's a great win on his resume for, you know, and by that point, Robinson had already lost to Lahana and stuff, and that was just, you know, on the way still. And, like, you know, Robin uh, Armstrong, after his career ended, like you said, he still struggled with a lot of stuff. Like, there was problems going on in his life, but he became – did he ever end up become an alcoholic or anything? Or not really? He just, like, money issues? Yeah, he had something going on that he, like, quit to become a preacher, I want to say. I can't remember what it was off the top of my head, though. Like, it might have been alcohol. It was something he ended up going through. But, I mean, like, he yeah. becomes a preacher, still struggling throughout his life. But you would see him make little appearances here and there, sometimes at fights and all that. There was a photo of him and Mike, him elderly with uh, young Mike Tyson, I think, as Tyson was champ. That, that has surfaced online. Um, I wish there was a photo of this because I haven't seen one. But Harold, uh, not Harold Lemon, Larry Merchant mentions before speaking of the first Arguello prior fight that Armstrong came to that fight and he was ringside for it because, you know, he had heard obviously about the similarities in style prior and himself and all that and wanted to be ringside to see what it was about. And that would have been a fucking awesome photo op. And I'm assuming that nothing was done of that because, like, I would have feel like you would have found that a long time ago at some point, right? <laughs> yeah, I've never seen it. Yeah, I've never seen it. I've never seen anyone talk about it. Like, if you Google Aaron Pryor and Henry Armstrong, nothing's going to come up except, like, you know, boxing forums comparing them together. Pretty like, much. not about, like, yeah. them meeting each other, you know, in the early 80s or something like that, so. <laughs> yeah, dude. Um he was he had like a similar to Ray Robinson actually. He had uh some like youth centers in LA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um and like like I said, you know, he was like a preacher, he was like a minister or something. But he had uh some kind of religious based youth centers in LA that he had gotten into uh the last few decades of his life and had I don't want to like, you know, dismiss them. It sounds like he he's done some good. And I know at least one of them is still around. Like it's like the Henry Armstrong Foundation, I want to say. Um and they still do some kind of Christian based ministry and youth outreach uh in the LA area. So, you know, his legacy in that regard lives on. And I mean it lives on obviously through us too, because we're remembering him. But a lot of people do. One of the greatest fighters of all time, dude. And he lost like, you know, half of his first six, six to eight fights. Yeah. What a bum he was that turned out to be, huh? <laughs> Didn't have an O. Lost his O. Yeah. Oh, Mayweather would have stopped him in three rounds, man. <laughs> yeah, right. Having a tough time with Castillo. Throw, throw Armstrong in there, buddy. You know, and it's interesting, too, that like, all right, there was a clip I put on Twitter, I don't know, probably a year or two ago or so. Or Armstrong was in a movie with Billy Kahn, mm -hmm. and and they're sparring together, right? And clearly they're not really, you know, it's kind of going through the motions and all that. But you can even though Kahn was so much bigger than I mean, Kahn wasn't a big guy, but like he's clearly bigger than Armstrong, who was short and stumpy. And even then, the way they're fighting, you can almost get the sense that like if they were if it was a real fight, Armstrong could probably put hands on Kahn if he really wanted to a little bit. Like the way he was moving. And, like, how he was going in and jabbing and getting himself in there and all that. Like, and Cotton was kind of a stand-up, you know, straight-up guy. Like, he wouldn't have had, you know, an easy time with a guy like Armstrong. He's, he's one of those fighters where, like, you you take a step or two back and think you're good, and he's on your ass. He's already yeah. there. And you're like, what the, what? One of those and, fighters. Well, the way he would jump divisions and all of that, that's why people kind of gave, like, Pacquiao was slightly compared to him a little bit in terms of, like, significant and also to like you know exciting style like it was the comparisons can be kind of easy but like yeah you know armstrong is just one of those guys he can never be forgotten he should never be forgotten like it's going to be coming up now crazily enough i mean scary like in the next 15 to 20 years it'll be 100 years since he was you know doing his business right <laughs> and yeah that's really scary but we're getting old man yeah, um, i don't want to think about that shit the fuck <laughs> But speaking of all-time greats who lost their pro debut, we can go back actually 100 years to a guy who was, you know, in his absolute prime because unless I'm completely fucked up here, Benny Leonard lost his pro debut, correct? Pretty sure he did. I'm, I'm, 
I'm almost positive that he did, but now of course I have to go. He's like I said though, remember when we were we were talking about Arguello a minute ago? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Oh. uh there was an article in one of the nineties issues of the ring that like specifically was about this. And I remember that Arguello was listed in that. And now I'm like, okay, yeah. Yeah, because Mickey Finnegan, that was the whole that was the whole uh that was in that article too. It was Arguello, Benny Leonard, Armstrong, a handful of other fighters in that article. So yes, no, you are correct. Yeah, okay. Uh, I was like, wait a second, hold on. Just want to make sure. double check, <laughs> make sure Bob Yalen didn't didn't pull the rug out from under us on this one too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have to mention Benny Leonard when you talk about you know all time greats, um, who made their pro debut and Leonard, a guy who over a hundred years ago he made his pro debut in 1911. And his absolute prime of when he was dazzling the boxing world was in the 20s. Um, it's what a brilliant career that is. And like one of those guys, too, that like hardcore historians, he's never mentioned today among modern fans. I don't even know if they even know who he is. And I get that. But like if you're going to do your research, and especially in a sport as vast as boxing is, you have to look at a person like Benny Leonard. And not only that, in my opinion, like you have no excuse. If there's footage out there, yes, his fights were over 100 years old now, some of them, but the footage is there and it's clear footage. It's not like it's, you know, watching them there and looking like an Atari thing of two guys kind of pixelated bouncing off of each other. You can see his brilliance. And Benny Leonard was one of the most brilliant fighters in boxing history. His style holds up in any end generation, anything. And if people are like, oh, he was going from the 20s. If you really think a guy that looked like that back then as as advanced as he was back in the twenties, if you think he wouldn't have like, you know, adapted to how boxing was today, you're an absolute idiot. <laughs> During this time, uh, you know, the late teens and through the twenties or most of the twenties, obviously Jack Dempsey was a hero. Jack Dempsey was the biggest celebrity heavyweight champion, et cetera. But there were other fighters during this time, you know, during his reign were, you know, numerous people. It's not like anybody, people thought about Jack Dempsey as unbeatable, partially because of his personality and celebrity, but also because he was the heavyweight champion. I don't think there was really any illusion that Jack Dempsey was like the most skilled champion out there or the most skilled fighter out there. Um, and, you know, basically fighters like, uh, Mickey Walker, for instance, Harry Greb, and Benny Leonard, they were all fighters who writers and pundits and those kinds of people recognized as fighters being you know, more skilled than Jack Dempsey. Again, Jack Dempsey, far bigger celebrity, you know, along with Babe Ruth, probably the two biggest sports celebrities during the 1920s or during this period. But Benny Leonard, again, extremely skilled a guy who uh, all of the experts, like, you know, how they, they these days say, oh, it's your favorite fighter's favorite fighter. That was Benny Leonard back in the day. You know, the all the pundits and the people who knew what was what basically loved Benny Leonard and recognized him as the most skilled fighter around or the best pound for pound or whatever. And rightfully so, man. I mean, you know, Leonard, you have to remember, came up in a deep, deep, deep lightweight era. Um, yeah, disgusting so, lightweight era. <laughs> ridiculous. And so he missed out on, like, obviously the late 1800s turn of the century guys, like, you know, Kid Levine and all those other guys, like Young Griffo and stuff. But, like, by the time, so, you know, it's, he just missed out on guys like Joe Gans, too, right? But, like, Joe Gans and Walgas battling Nelson, stuff like that. They're doing their things now. I mean, that was such a deep era. And, Joe Gaines passed away, had wall guys some battling Nelson, kind of just, you know, pet her out on their own from who's the damage they're doing to each other and everything else from that era. And now, now soon after that, a guy like Willie Ritchie becomes champion. Ritchie, who I became fascinated with because, again, and Peter Hell is, I keep on bringing this book up, but that book meant so much to me as a kid, you know? Um, in terms of boxing history, I learned so much from it. And Willie Ritchie is the first person that's interviewed in that book. He's the first chapter in it because he was the first champion, the oldest champion. Um, he became champion. What was it, Pat? Like 1910, 11 or so? Yeah, something like when that. He beat, when he beat Wallgast. So 
this is what I mean by the era Leonard finally came up in. Like Leonard was boxing a little bit before that, but when he finally came of age, when he was about to become champion, this is where I'm bringing like with this era at. So Willie Ritchie becomes champion. He's from the um, he's the new era now, like post Walgas Gans um, battling Nelson, and he beats Walgas for the belt, beats him in a rematch, knocks out Mexican Joe Rivers, who was another stalwart from that era. Um, and then he eventually loses the belt on a close decision to um, uh, what's it, Freddie Welch, who was an absolute menace of himself that during that time too. All the accounts of him just a pain in the ass to fight. And Welsh, you know, from England. And um, this is when Leonard now comes of age when, like, he's at, you know, on the cusp of um, ready to challenge for a championship. He ends up challenging Freddie Welsh for the belt. And like you said, Freddie Welsh, great fighter, one of the greatest Welsh fighters of all time. Uh, highly polished, good puncher. Um, Alpha, too, wasn't he? I think so. Yeah. Just a pain in the ass. Like every time I read about him and look, even he looked like a pain in the ass to fight. Just his, just his photos. Well, and he's got the, he's got the classic butt chin, you know, like the, yeah, yeah. The everything chin. about him. He looks like he's tough. He just looks like yeah, a manly looking style. fellow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kirk Douglas looking guy. Um, yeah. And a great fighter. And this is also during a time of extreme flux when it comes to the rules of boxing and I mean, we've talked about this before on numerous shows where going from the the bare knuckle, quote unquote, era to the gloved era was not a smooth transition. It wasn't just, oh, John L. Sullivan, now it's the gloved era. Nah, dude, there was like, you know, negotiations here and there in different divisions, blah, blah, blah. But also what was in flux was the the laws and regulations around the country, sometimes county by county, city by city. They changed uh, decisions were allowed here, but not there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You couldn't lose your title unless it was by knockout, all that sorts of stuff. And so that made following some of these title reigns a little bit difficult sometimes, but it also meant that uh, there was a lot of value to a fighter who was super tough and was not getting hurt and not getting knocked down or knocked out. That meant that like that dude was not going to lose his title. You know, it was pretty much guaranteed. And that kind of uh, Benny Leonard kind of fell under that umbrella with a, with a lot of this time frame here. Cause there were so many laws that were outlawing decisions in boxing. That's why when you go on to a lot of these fighters record, uh, Freddie Welsh, Benny Leonard, right around this time, you see NWS, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. newspaper decision, all this and all that type of shit. It's basically they're just pulling the newspaper clippings from all of these fights and trying to figure out who of the people in attendance thought won. And because there was no official decision rendered because it was illegal, they didn't allow it. And so, again, just to drive home the point that it's sometimes tough to figure out what was what in some of these eras because of that true and before leonard became champion you know this is like still 1915 16 whatever it may be he's going through some tough competition himself you know what i mean like he had to fight freddie welsh a couple of times before he finally knocked him out the window belt he had to go through johnny dundee who was a legend absolute fucking legend himself what a long career in the early yeah, 1900s, like 350 fights or something yeah crazy you know shit. and and others too so it wasn't like you know, he was just being fast tracked to anything. He was taking L's, and these weren't like you know official ones because, like you said, they would say NWS, you know, newspaper decision, blah 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 blah. But like, these are still learning experiences that he's learning from on these guys. Like Johnny Kilbane had already already had seventy two something fights. Johnny Dundee had over a hundred fights by the time he had got into him with him. This is still like nineteen sixteen. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's incredible. But this is the type of thing that they had to go through. And considering the fact, too, that Leonard was another one who kind of came through where his mom didn't want him to fight and he had to go through all kinds of other hurdles to get where he had to go to, like, it's it's wild. But this is, you know, what builds a fighter. This is what builds a guy like Leonard. Like, he's learning through all these different fights. You know, it's it the thing, the difference between taking a loss today and people just automatically writing you off is that they don't look at it as a learning experience, as they should, you know? When a guy like then back in the day, like a guy like Benny Leonard or Henry Armstrong or whoever it may be from a different type of era, if you took a loss, 
you know, it wasn't looked upon as, as being the end at all, especially if you weren't like blown out by them. You know what I mean? Like it was a close fight. It was competitive, but okay. Someone's clearly ex- more experienced than you. And they just had something, you know, they taught you a trick or two. You learned from that. That was that learning experience. You took what you learned from that loss. You added to your next one. Eventually you fight a rematch with them, beat them and keep on going from there today. Oh, oh you lost one fight. That's the end of it. Bah, 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 bah. But like, yeah, or you get tied up, it. tied up for 18 months because there was a fucking rematch clause, and now your yeah, training yeah, camp you is know. fucking 14 weeks. And so, like, you know, thank God for these, I guess, to their credit, that they had these new pa- newspaper decisions that weren't, like, official losses on their record. But these were all just learning experiences for them. Like, they just took it, and they fought the next week, and then after that, and soon after, and would fight multiple times that same dude. And sometimes it took them two or three times before they finally beat them, like, you know <laughs> yeah it's it, just the amount of fights on a lot of these fighters record is like obscene it's obscene yeah. and that's why fighters these days a lot of them just can't catch up in terms of rating alongside them all time it has nothing to do with they're not good or whatever it's just yeah. how do you fucking compete with 300 fights and a large chunk of them being against actually good fighters yeah, you can't. Really and, a, and a guy like Benny Leonard, too, during his lightweight title reign, defeating welterweights, too. Like, he was going up and fighting for the welterweight title against Ted Kid Lewis and coming damn close to defeating him for the welterweight title. Uh, you know, defeating guys like Jack Britton, who yeah. himself was a damn good fighter, uh, you know, and he basically fought a who's who from welterweight and a number of, or um, uh, from lightweight and a number of welterweights from that era. Sure. And, I mean, by the time he finally ends up fighting Britain and beating him for the belt, it's like, um, you know, now he's going to be the man. And not only that, like, it felt like there was going to, like, a future star in the division now. You know what I mean? Like, Freddie Welsh was a top fighter, but I don't know how popular he was going to be on the stage because he was a guy that had to, like, travel by ship. You know, it wasn't like you had planes and everything back then, just readily available to be flying wherever you want and transferring stuff like that, like... These were these dudes who'd be like, oh, you know, the world champion's coming over. It's going to take him a month by steamship to get here. And then he's going to train and then he'll end up fighting whoever it may be. Like, you have Leonard now who is charismatic, really, really good looking, um, can fight his ass off, has this whole shit where, like, you know, he has his hair, like, pompered and stuff like that. And if you knock it off, then he's going to get all fucking, like, flustered. And he's moving now into a new era of this lightweight where you have this host of contenders that like from that past i was just like i don't know if you want to say they're more advanced or whatever it was but like you felt you felt a sense of change you know you got guys like lou tendler in there and um rocky kansas and um we beat before he before he became champion but like um who am i who's not thinking on there like um the mitchell brothers and like there's a whole host of guys out there you know what i mean well, and I think that a lot of, uh, at least some of it had to do with what we were talking about, where this b- extremely brutal lightweight era in the early 1900s, right before this, yeah. fights were going 30, 40, 50 era. rounds. Yeah. Some of them were scheduled to to go until somebody couldn't go anymore. And so when that had changed and those fights were no longer a thing and they had kind of gone out of, you know, the public was like, nah, dude, we're not putting up with that shit anymore, um, you know, though endurance was still important stamina is still important it always is in boxing but also i think that now with there being a def- a definite limit to fights and the limits a lot shorter which you know we're looking at and we're like 15 20 rounds because for a while it was 20 rounds too but 15 rounds we're like wow that's three rounds longer than 12 well they saw it as like well now this is a set limit and this is the time sure. we have to do some shit and I think that that might have inspired um, a lot of fighters to really start honing their skills and figuring shit out a little bit more. And I mean, of course, I'm pulling that at least partially out of my ass, but I'm just guessing that that's what it was. Because you, like you said, Lou Tendler, widely considered one of the greatest fighters to never win a world championship. Uh, fantastic yeah. southpaw, um, you know, gave Leonard hell for a number of different in a number of different, or I think a couple of different fights. I want to say. Um, but Jack Britton, also a skilled fighter, Ted Kid Lewis, hard, tough guy, but also skilled. Um, uh, you know, there was kind of change in the wind. It really was. And um he was even able to knock back a couple of guys from like the uh, the older era, like Willie Ritchie 
came back in came back into time and their first fight which i want to say was like four six i don't know it was just like it wasn't that many rounds right but people generally said that richie got the better of it that they did and that like prompted enough that they should have a rematch for the actual championship and then leonard really you know put on the fucking boots on that one it was like nah i'm not gonna bullshit on that and like put a, put a beating on him and stop him <laughs> and that became like you know the main thing with him like that kind of i think that win basically solidified he was like all right this is like my era now and like the past is in the past because that's why i said he started you know defending against all these other legendary guys like lou tendler would have been a champion easily as a lightweight champion could have dominated that era if benny leonard wasn't around and he gave leonard absolute hell in the times that they fought they were just really really close knit affairs that leonard had to pull out from the skin you know had to pull out from those and other fighters too like you know richie mitchell and other guys like those were tough fights um the one that stands out also too is you know one of the more controversial fights from that era is when he challenged Jack Britton for the welterweight champions. <laughs> and, like, he had already fought Britton a couple of times in no decisions or whatever it may be, newspaper decisions and stuff. One of the most like, baffling results ever. It, you know, even to this day, I wish... That's one of those fights, too, that you wish there was footage of and, like, clear footage, not just, like, whatever you can imagine it would have been if it was filmed back then, but it's absolutely baffling because, by all accounts, you know, Britton, I think he was a little bit older than Leonard, right? Might have been, I don't know. But, was um, what I'm sorry. I said Britain was a little bit older than Leonard, wasn't he? I think so, yeah. But Britain was another dude who had a legendary career. Had I don't know, fought Ted Kid Lewis 800 times, and um, one of those guys that a master boxer, and you couldn't knock him out. Like he had a ridiculous chin himself. It was just so, which means he was a nightmare to fight. And um, he was welterweight champion. And when he fought Leonard, Leonard was the lightweight champion, moved up. And this was a big fight. Another one of those that, like, in today's day and age, it would definitely make pay-per-view or whatever it would be. It would be huge. And um, by all accounts, Leonard was getting outboxed by him. Like, Britain was outboxing him throughout the fight. Like, Leonard was kind of, you know, not himself. And, like, he was competitive. I mean, like, it was close, but, like, Britain had the advantage over it. And then finally... Um, what round was it where like Leonard finally broke through and dropped him like with a body shot or something? Yeah, it was it said it was uh, so he lost in the 13th, but it was the round before that that he had started uh, laying down a whooping. OK. And yeah, it was like round, so he starts like really breaking through. It starts beating him down and Britain's obviously fading. And then I he drops him at some point. I don't know if it was a body shot or whatever it was. And Britain goes down and then Leonard. Um, what year was that? A 1922. 1922. So like 70 something years before Roy Jones would do the same thing to Montel Griffin. Um, Britain is laying there and like um, Benny Leonard walks up and just like pieces him up while he's on the canvas. Right. So from the descriptions, it's like worse than, than Roy Jones Griffin. Like from the descriptions, it was like similar, but it was like even worse. Like, he like went like walked over across the ring to him and was like bah! like like obvious like and people were yeah, like yeah, what yeah. the fuck like like they had to disqualify him there was no choice sure, sure. and when that happens everyone's just kind of flabbergasted by the whole ordeal because like what the fuck and obviously that creates a lot of controversy because did he throw the fight did he do not because you said it was so blatant and he was always considered like a really classy guy. Yeah, that, like, yeah, yeah. And they're like, like how did he lose his head now of all times? Because of, like it just didn't make sense. None of it made sense. Yeah, it 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 was very strange. And of course, that's the that's the place most people go to when strange shit happens. You know, it's, it's a corruption. Somebody bought so and so. You know, I I get it, but you know, that's usually it's usually incompetence and not corruption, guys. But regardless, I, I understand. And definitely a wild fucking result, dude. Yeah. The descriptions have him just walking over and pow. Yeah, and it, it just makes no sense when you think about it. But then even so, like Ring Magazine, I remember years and years and years later when they were like going through the most controversial moments in boxing history. That was one of the times that they talked about and they gave like different scenarios that Leonard intentionally threw it or they were like, no, he just lost his mind. I don't know. Things happen like 
we'll never know. Everybody involved in that has clearly been dead for decades and decades and decades, and we'll never know exactly what happened or why it happened. But um, yeah, that's boxing for you. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, uh, you know, Benny Leonard wound up holding the lightweight title for for several more years, or a few more years after that, I should say. But uh, you mentioned him being long dead because wasn't Benny Leonard the one who died while refereeing a fight? Yeah, absolutely. Years yeah. later, after and so, so he, he definitely the, can't tell a story. Yeah, so he retires, and after you know, long reigning as lightweight champion, he retires as lightweight champion, and what a cool. You know, before I get to that, that must have been such a cool era to be a fan because you got Dempsey as heavyweight champion. You got Benny Leonard as lightweight champion. Um, Mickey Walker, probably at some point, you know, welterweight champion. Harry Greb as middleweight and Pancho Villa for a cup of coffee as like the flyweight champion, you know. There were actually yeah, back then that would have been fun. <laughs> Dude, just the the amount of. uh sports stars that emerged in the 1920s like he, not even just in boxing but you know yeah true joe dimaggio babe ruth uh dimaggio fucking, came later but yeah johnny we johnny weiss weiss muller ty mm -hmm. cobb fucking you know the bobby jones like there's yeah. all these fucking massive sports stars and of course you know benny leonard was at least in boxing he was up there you know obviously jack dempsey's up there but benny leonard was up there dude Sure. And so I'll, um, so like Leonard makes a comeback, you know what I mean? Finally, after the Great Depression, I mean, during the Great Depression, because like it was, uh, what was it? He was part of the Wall Street. You know, I mean, he was a big, yeah, he had lost some, he lost everything. Amount. Yeah. During Wall Street, and he was forced to come back after that. He initially retired because his mother, who always hated him as a boxer, even when he was champion and making money, she finally like begged him and convinced him. And he was like, all right, I'm done. And so he retires and, you know, he's initially recognized as probably the greatest lightweight ever, ever lived and rightfully so. I mean, it was just incredible. But when he retires, you know, he's doing his thing and gains a little bit of weight, whatever he's doing that. But then like the Wall Street crash happens and um, he's forced to come back. And now he's like receding hairline and it's the early 30s. And clearly he's not the same as he was, but he still has a little bit of something. And now he's trained by Ray Arcel. And Ray Arcel was a dude who idolized him, idolized Leonard, as everybody did. When Leonard was champion and Arcel was still an up-and-coming, you know, aspiring trainer and hanging around gyms and shit. And Arcel found it to be an honor, and rightfully so, when Leonard asked him to train him for his comeback. And as he did, you know, he went through the regular amount of guys, but, like, it just, like I said, it clearly was just not the same Leonard. Like, people were hoping it was still popular to see because, like, you know, this is a guy that was that legend and everyone wants to know it. But you just knew at some point it was going to come to a head. And then in 1932, he fights Jimmy McLaren. And then, uh, well, that just, that didn't end well at all. You know, like, Leonard, he got dropped early. He got beat up throughout. And he just, it was no contest. And, um... I'll relay a quick story before we move on. But like Bud Schulberg, one of the greatest writers of all time. And um, didn't he was the writer of On the Waterfront or he directed it or something? Advised it or something. Yeah. Or inspired it or some shit. Yeah. yeah. So like, I mean, Bud Schulberg is just recognized as one of the greatest writers ever, you know, just in everything and a legend in boxing. And I was honored enough to have a chance to meet him when he got inducted to the Hall of Fame and spend a few minutes with him on stage, you know, chatting with him and such. But he had an article in a magazine back in the 90s. I don't remember if it was for Ring. I want to say it was for the Ill, uh, Bill, Bill, what's his name? Um, uh, Burt Sugar's Fight Game magazine. Remember that one from the mm -hmm. late 90s, early 2000s? I want to say it was an article in that. I might be wrong. I don't know. Regardless, Bud Schulberg wrote a pendant article where he was talking about as a kid. He was going to go see Benny Leonard with his dad, and he was so excited. And because Leonard was a hero, and everybody was a hero to him, yada, yada, yada. And his dad finally told him, yo, I'm going to take you to see Leonard tonight at the Garden. And he was hyped. And he was telling all his friends at school what he was going to do that night. He was going to go see Benny Leonard. And finally, his friends were all jealous and all that bullshit. So they go there. They get to the Garden. And his dad, who already had, like, basically just set seats for every show, came in. And then... The uh the concierge person looks down. He was like, "Yo, I can't let you have your kid in here." He's like, "You fucking crazy!" 
And Bud Schuler's like, what? And the dad was like, nah, we cool and everything. He was like, no, no, no. He's like, I literally can't let any kids in here. Like, we can't have kids here. I'm like, no. And so the dad and Bud Schuler, he said, is crying. And the dad was like quick thinking. He didn't know what to do. So he took his kid and rushed back to his house and just dropped him off to the mom and just rushed back to the garden. <laughs> like he couldn't, you know. And he said Bud Schuler said he was sitting there crying all night until his dad came home. And his dad told him how much of a ridiculous fight it was against against um uh Richie Mitchell, which I guess was like an all-out brawl and one of the best fights you could have imagined. And that just devastated him, right? That he couldn't watch it. And so he said, fast forward years later. And now he's like, you know, in college and able to do this or whatever. He's, you know, doing stuff. And he finally was able to see Ben and Leonard live. And unfortunately, it was the McLaren fight. Belfast Spider got his ass, unfortunately. I mean, everybody, everybody beats the end. And that was the end. And that was one, too, that I guess McLaren was going through and beating the shit out of a, a lot of Jewish fighters. And everyone was just kind of hoping that Leonard would be the one to curb the tide one more time. And well, no. Nah. <laughs> well, and I was going to say, too, you know, historically speaking and like on a social level or whatever, uh, Benny Leonard was a massive hero in the Jewish community. Of course, his, his name, the Ghetto Wizard, which, of course, now people hear ghetto and they think a totally different thing. But ghetto used to be uh, the description of basically like a lot of places that were like heavily Jewish or whatever in parts of cities, like the Warsaw Ghetto. That's probably the one of the more famous ones that people remember. And usually from the portion of their history class that talks about World War II. But nonetheless, uh, he was a massive hero to a lot of people in the Jewish community. And during a time, too, when there were a ton of immigrants, we've talked about this before, and the people, uh, a large portion of the people flowing into places like New York, especially, you know, New York had entire neighborhoods that were considered Jewish neighborhoods as, you know, they kind of still do now, but less so nonetheless, you know, he was a huge, huge hero in that community. And so for him to kind of come back, I could, I could understand how somebody like Bud Schulberg and a lot of other like, you know, young Jewish fight fans and whatnot could really look up to a guy like Benny Leonard easily. But uh, Jimmy McLarnon, a great fighter in his own right, just the wrong guy for a guy like Penny Leonard to come back against, unfortunately. Oh, totally, man. And even if you have a dozen fights or so, a guy like McLarnon is just going to show you that what, what level you're on, you're not there anymore. And like we said, Leonard was like kind of paunchy at that point. His hairline was back there. And like, even though he still showed like glimpses of what he could do, like for instance, there's... um. In one of the uh, time capsules in Ring magazine, they show a, they show a, a still photo, still photo. Obviously, they show a photo of him um, fighting uh, a tough guy back then from that era named Polly Walker, and you see Lennon in the way um, Stanley Weston is explaining it. You just it's a it's a photo of like Walker charging, and Leonard just has his palm open palm on Walker's head, like holding him like Matador style. And it's just like, you can tell it's an old move that he did back in the day or whatever, and it's working perfectly. And they were explaining what it was, but they're also explaining that he's like old as dirt and is just like, you know, in a mirage from his past. And it's, it's sad, you know? And like, in like you alluded to earlier, he did pass away soon after that. Like he retires after getting knocked out by McLaren. And um, I'd have to check when he actually passed away, but it was, I want to say in the 40s or so. Yeah, it was 1947 at St. Nick Arena. And they said he was refereeing. So like back then, it wasn't uncommon for a referee to like almost be the the same ref for almost all the fights that night. It was just mm -hmm. one ref. And Leonard, who was being the ref that night and going through the motions and going through all, he just suddenly collapsed right there. Yep, had a heart attack and died. Like before he got to the dressing room, was dead. Um, and it was, I don't want to say it was like a national tragedy, but it was reported by national newspapers. And it was definitely like a, a shock yeah i mean sure you know like and you see leonard's photos of him at that time i mean yeah, he wasn't thin or anything like clearly he had put on some weight and some other stuff and we don't i don't know about the lifestyles of back then in terms of like the healthiness of what people were eating and what was Bro, going those on. motherfuckers were bong ripping asbestos <laughs> It's just, you know, it is sad though. Like, and imagine you're a fan of the arena that night hoping to get a Leonard autograph, or you might have had at that point. Then you just say it watching the fights, and all of a sudden, homeboy just collapses right there. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. brutal, dude. Yep. Crazy. Yeah. I mean, and easily now, 
however many years later, more than a hundred years later, actually, he's still considered one of the greatest lightweights of all time. People argue, and, right, and rightfully so. Rightfully so. I don't want to hear any of these stupid fans be like, oh, he fought so long ago, that can't be the case. He was fighting bums. There ain't no bums back then. If anything, they were probably more smarter than what they are today in terms of how to actually approach a fight in the scientifically. You know what I mean? Like these dudes just I can I can only present so much information on my social yeah. media accounts. I can't force people to look at it rationally, unfortunately. Or why don't you just like sit there and read read their like actual interviews of what they talked about, how they broke things right. down, all and the how information's they there. All you know, like, you you can't force people yeah. to consume it, unfortunately. But they you, know, man. Like, oh my god, just to think, like if Benny Leonard again, if a guy like Henry Armstrong or Benny Leonard or any of these people from way way you know, over a hundred years ago or close to it now, where it had access to the type of equipment and everything else and whatever it may be to this game. That they wouldn't adjust to everything. Like, of course they would. <laughs> and they would just whoop ass even more so. I'm sorry, but like, it is what it is, man. You know, well, that's, they are still... that's the other part of it that people forget when they talk about fighters or better, better athletes or something like that. And yeah, like, look at all that they have twice the accomplishments being not as good athletes, you fucking idiot. That actually proves my point even more, you dipshit. <laughs> <laughs> and and Ray Arcel is one of those guys that look like you can tell in some of his interviews he does have a little bit of fandom for when he was young for guys like Dempsey and stuff. And I get it. You know, when you're first coming up and you first see that first dynamic person on the scene that you get to kind of be close to and watch all that, you get, you know, an affinity for it. And I totally get that when he was young and learning and seeing Benny Leonard live and up close, just dazzling shit that no one's ever seen before that you can get like rose tinted glasses on, right? But that being said, Arcel was one of those dudes who came from that era and watched everything because he lived a remarkably long life all the way. And he was active up, up until, you know, his death in the 90s. And wasn't just a fan either, but was like watching it. Yes, you know? watching everything and clearly proved himself from each decade of knowing how to like, you know, take his knowledge and put it into a fight that his guy won. Like he wasn't some dude in a long lost era who was just stuck in his ways or whatever and never like, no, he knew what he was doing. He knew how to adapt and adjust and everything like that. And took what he had. And, you know, that's why he was like, for instance, um, who was it? The, the famous cartoonist was it Bill Gallo. Yeah. Bill Gallo. Mm -hmm. Um, back in the early when, when ESPN, uh, what was it? Classic sports network first came on the scene they were doing like little mini, like half an hour documentaries on fighters, right? Like, you know, you had Armstrong, you had this one, that one, blah, blah, blah. And they did one on Duran. And the very first thing they show is Gallo. And he goes, I have in my office a photo of Benny Leonard and Ray. He's like, Ray Arcel with Benny Leonard. And you see them two together and sitting down in the corner together, right? He was like, above it, I have a photo of Ray Arcel with Roberto Duran. Here is a man that trained the two greatest lightweights in the history of the sport in a span of like 60 years. And then you just hear, dun, 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 like the Latin music and grand murdering people. But like, think about that. That's what I mean. What, what I'm getting at is that like a guy like Arcel, who saw everything in the evolution of the sport from back then to what it was. And then when people asked him who was the greatest fighter he ever worked with, he still said Benny Leonard. Sorry, Barry Tompkins, but he got your ass on fucking Tommy Gibbons. <laughs> Seriously, man. Like, I'll never forget that. <laughs> oh, you know, unranked up. And you just see his face. He was like, what? He got so mad at that. Like, because you he, must he's still, not know who Tom Gibbons was. He's still a gentleman, so he's not going to curse you out. But he's like really under his breath. He was like, well, you must not know who Tommy Gibbons is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You don't know you what you don't that know, era. How dare you disrespect a guy like that? <laughs> you obviously don't know. Yeah, he was like, bro, Tommy Gibbons was one of the best fighters we had from that era. Fuck what was ranked or not back then. Like, <laughs> You know, just uh, among an incredible fucking era from the Great Lakes, yeah. dude. Come on now. He was like, it was a good fight. And it was like, it was for Dempsey's first comeback fight. That's about as good as you can get what you mean. And then he has to go and be like, well, yeah, Dempsey comes back and gets a good but unranked. But unranked. <laughs> and you're like, hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, mic drop. Fucking jerk. Oh, man, Just kidding, Barry. Awesome. We love you. But, no, I do it's... love Barry Tompkins, but that is really funny to think. No, about. it was a great like, segment. 
can pick shit like that up and be like, wait a minute, there is some slight tension here. And he definitely did like, wait a minute, I'm not going to let you get over me. He was unranked, folks, okay? <laughs> yeah, he got, well, he got the final say on the production. What are you going to say, you know? All right, cut. Arcel looks at him. How dare you? <laughs> yeah. I got hit in the head with a pipe over this shit. Are you kidding me? How dare you talk about Tom Gibbons? Give him I, well, the old fucking hey, buzz. Am I Oliver wrong to say he was on rank? Well, whoop, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dumbass. So get him like Buzz Aldrin got that fucking guy in the interview. Yeah, word. Um, we got time for another, right? Yeah, let's. I'm gonna do a twofer. I'm gonna yes, do a twofer do right now. Two part. What do you mean? Oh, twofer. Go for it. I'm gonna do a twofer because it fits. And sure. uh, I actually forgot about this because I thought I didn't realize. I thought that it was only Rafa Marquez. But I forgot yeah. that it was also Juan Manuel Marquez. They both lost their fucking pro debut. That's right. They did. I mean, you know, why not? Let's talk about some Rafa and Juan Manuel Marquez. Yeah, um, a little bit more modern, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, can't really go through their entire careers. Although Rafa's career is a little bit shorter, so that would be easier to do. But nonetheless, um, two fighters who came up from, Mex from a right around Mexico City and were also for the vast majority of their career, if not their entire career, because I think they also, I think they both might have turned pro under Nacho Beristain. But, um, I mean, it also goes to show, unfortunately, if that were the case, that Nacho, not the greatest manager, <laughs> Just not the greatest manager, and he unfortunately showed that several times again through both in during both of their careers as professionals. Great trainer, not a good manager. That being said, uh, they both they both lost their professional debuts. Um, I remember hearing about both of them uh, in like I guess it would have been probably the mid to late nineties because it was thinking of when the Norwood fight was because by then obviously I saw him. But at some point, I remember reading about them in like the ring or something like that. And that was part of the thing was that, like they were like, oh, they're brothers from, you know, they're both uh, one's the the brawler, one's the kind of counter punching, you know, kind of boxer type of guy. And they're both, you know, under Nacho Betty Stein, who uh, had Daniel Zarigosa and like you know, a whole bunch of other fighters by this point, too. And so they were kind of like, uh, especially in the kind of Southern California area written about a little bit more than other fighters might have been. So I remember reading about them. Um, but I mean, it wasn't really until dude, we've talked about Juan Manuel Marquez and his earlier career before he had a lot of stinky fights, a lot of kind of tentative performances where like, dude, he was not super convincing as somebody that you really wanted to see where on the other hand, little ass bantamweight Rafa Marquez was just laying waste to fools or getting hurt real badly, you know, or cut real bad. So he's like a fighter to watch. Um, but I remember kind of reading about them when they both came up. And so I was intrigued for sure. So I heard about Juan Manuel first before I ever heard of Rafa Marquez. Um, Juan Manuel, I first heard about in, geez, I want to say when I first started becoming a fan, it wasn't like they had full fledged features on him such and like things like that, you know what I mean? Where they were just like, just dedicating pages upon pages on him. It was more so I was like reading results and like, you know, little side things about how he was an up and coming guy or a guy that was a top, you know, not a like contender. A to watch yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, something. yeah. Things of that, for that nature. Like the first time I really, you know, knew of his name was when he fought Julian Wheeler, who was a former 92 Olympian. Mm -hmm. And at that point in time, he only had one loss on his career. And I don't know if he was still looked upon as a guy that was going to be a world champion. Probably not. But at that point, too, like, he was, you know, with only one loss, he he still had, like, um, money to his name, right? You know what I mean? Like, promotion and people can, like, invest in him, if anything. And I haven't watched the fight, but he was outboxing Marquez, from what I heard, for the most part, before Marquez rallied, it was, end up, you know, ended up stopping him in the last round. And for a guy like Marquez, who was, you know, kind of unknown at that point and came in more or less as the opponent, that was big. That was a big win for him. And soon from there, that's when he started, you know, finding more named guys like um, Julio Gravasio, who was a former world champion, and Freddy Cruz, who was a contender, and Daryl Pickney, who was one of my favorite journeymen of, um, you know, my childhood, because he was just one of those dudes who had a horrible record, but he had absolute TNT in his fists. And he knocked out Junior Jones, and he knocked out um, Jesse James Leha's cousin, Louis Leha. And, um, and that fight is funny for me for the fact that he um, he knocks the shit out of Leha, right? Like, knocks him silly. 
and then Michael Buffer in, um, accidentally announces Leha as the winner. And you see Pickney turn his head and he goes, <laughs> with his corner, and he was like, no, 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 like over here. And he was like, oh, excuse me, Daryl Pickney. <laughs> but those are, those are good wins, you know what I mean? And by this point, Marquez now is starting to like build himself to be looked upon to be like the number one contender at featherweight. And that's when like the scuttlebutt of him fighting Hamed eventually starts happening, right? It didn't really happen soon enough, like around 97 or so, but like it starts building up steam as the as the late 90s start rolling around. And by the time Marquez finally makes it to HBO against Freddie Norwood, like the hype of him is I want to say it's at a fever pitch. But it's definitely to the point where it's like, you know, everybody's intrigued to watch him, including myself, who was a seasoned fan at that point, and reading enough about him. He fought fight, at the forum like, like four or five times. Yeah. So it was, yeah, he had gotten a little bit of a following. And he was also on, I'm sure he was on TV for those forum fights. I didn't really watch those too much because they'd be on random times on Sundays and all that. And so I didn't get the catch. They showed him locally in LA too. Sure. So he was definitely big over there, not so much on the East Coast, but like, you know, that the fight with Norwood was definitely intriguing. It was one of those boxing after dark fights that they were known for back then, meaning like they would match fights, you know, guys like that. You know what I mean? Like undefeated, a little bit under the radar, but you want to see this because it's a big fight. And when that fight happened and I watched it, I was just like, the never fuck again. Yeah, it was awful. It was one of the worst fights I had witnessed up until that point for a title fight, especially one that I came in really excited to watch. I mean, it wasn't all Marquez's fault. I mean, Norwood definitely laid an egg in there too. Just a bad a stable. style ma- mashup, dude. Yeah, but Marquez just didn't do anything really in that fight to really warrant like me thinking that he could do something with one hot med, who admittedly was already slipping at that point. Like he was tentative. He didn't really know how to like let him his hands go. When he did, it was like not with authority. It was almost like rigid at least. And Norwood was in the sloppy ways was able to beat him to the punch and like sloppily outbox him. He, he dropped him too. Like it was just an ugly fight. It was an ugly fight that just wasn't just never worth watching again. But Norwood was able to scrape by and he won a decision. I thought he won. Like most people think that he did. And that did not help Marquez's momentum at all whatsoever like he was kind of stumped by that one you know because i just at that point like you know if anything you needed an emphatic win to really get you back on there and do something and instead like no one everyone's just kind of like well eh. and it took him a few years after that it took him a few definitely took him a few years before finally you know he was able to get his first what was that title fighting in 2003 or something but even before then, it still took him a couple of more years before he got back on HBO again. Because it, it, it was damaging because a lot of his kind of like of what they had said or like the reputation on the street or whatever you want to call it is that like uh, um, Marquez had become um, Hamed's mandatory. Yeah. And so Hamed, rather than facing him, dropped the belt. And so people were like, oh, you know, Marquez, he must be some badass because Hamed, you know, who is the ultimate badass, doesn't want to face him. And that was kind of the, you know, the gossip or whatever. And so, but then the Norwood fight happened at like the absolute worst time because not only did he lose, but he looked bad. So now there were two reasons for Hamed not to face him or for anybody not to face him for that matter. Cause you know, well make it three because he lost the fight. He didn't look good. And he's also a good fighter. And so, you know, why fight him? What the fuck? He basically had to uh, work his way back into contention. And I mean, one of the, the main fights that really helped him do that was that eliminator against Robbie Peden, which oh. I remember, dude, yeah, it's definitely one of the ickier fights for sure. But that was on the undercard of uh, Paul Spatafora, Angel Manfredi, which is definitely one of the most hilarious post-fight scenes you'll ever see in your face of your planet because Angel Manfredi is just sitting there whining and crying and fucking carrying on about how he won the fight after Paul Spatafora yeah, just slapped him around for 12 rounds. Hilarious. And that was after he went from uh, whatever it was before, the devil thing to got Jesus. I remember one of the that. most annoying and cringeworthy fucking about faces on the face of the planet. But anyway, uh, back to the Marquez Peden fight that was on the undercard of Spatafora Manfredi. 
might be reversed. Point is, Marquez started beating the shit out of Peden in like the last few rounds, and his body work got his ass so bad that Peden started puking blood in his corner, just like, Ugh. and like I said earlier, vomiting. I wasn't kidding; it wasn't a joke. A fighter vomits in the corner in the vast majority of states. That's an automatic like stoppage. What, however, that fighter is doing, winning or not, they start vomiting in the corner. Plugs getting pulled. Robbie Peden got his plug pulled by Marquez that night. I mean, that's an emphatic way to make the for your comeback on HBO to make a guy puke up blood. So, and I Peden was a good fighter. Yeah, Peden was a very good fighter. He ended up going on, you know, stopping Nate Campbell um, twice, <laughs> first time memorably, um, <laughs> and headlining a pay per view against Barrera. I think it was that any. So, mm. you know, but that was that was definitely a big win for him, and that obviously um, invited him back to like the networks if he was going to do something. So by that time he fights Manuel Medina. Now that was on like a low rent pay per view, I think it was. And Medina was one of those guys, like, you know, he turned pro. A the billion young... punches, none of them hurt. Yeah, God, he sucked the fight, man. I mean, like, I was, I always loved Medina in terms of just like being a scrap. Oh dude. yeah, He'd give a great effort, but just and frustrating you know what, fighter. Is that like he had a long ass career? Like he was never old. Like he always thought he was older than he was because he looked older in the face from all the damage he took in. The fact that he turned pro at like 12, not really 12, but you know what I mean? Like he was like 15 or some shit. Like one of them, you know, as a lot of Mexican fighters do, he turned pro ridiculously young and he packed on a lot of mileage for his career, but he was just good, you know? And like, like anytime you were like, okay, this is the last time we're going to see his ass. Even like during, before he fought Hamed against Tom Johnson, losing a couple of times and losing to John, John Molina, you're like, all right, this is the end of him. And then he still went on to have a memorable career for years after that. But that was, you know, a stoppage win over him was big. Like, that was a good one. That was a dominant win, and that was, like, the way it beat. But yeah. then... Certainly not in terms of being a dirty fighter, but in terms of the record yeah. not reflecting who he was. Kind of like a Fritzy Zivic in that regard. Sure, exactly. And so, again, he had one more, like, the bad luck that he was still having every time he was on the networks came in his next fight again before things really took off for him. And, like, you know, his superstardom really took off is that he had to fight Derek Gaynor. And this is in November of 2003. And I don't know, was that the, un this was on the undercard, I want to say, of Mayweather, um, Philip Endu, right? Now I'm going to have to double check, but I'm, I'm pretty sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah if it, I see it right now. It's a Grand Rapids. I had to have been. So um, my dumbass really thought Gaina was going to beat him in this fight. All right. Like I just thought, you know, slick southpaw, blah, 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 Marquez, this and that. And, you know, I thought Gaina was like actually trying. And then it just ends up being the one. Of you the worst weren't alone. A lot of people did. Yeah, it was bad. So fucking uh, Yeah, bad. but bro, Derek Gaynor was just stuck. Talking about uh, frustrating fighters to watch, dude. A guy who was extremely talented, very quick, but would just like lose focus in the middle of a fight and then just get bang, like dinged around for no reason. And against Marquez just would not engage, dude. Like almost was literally running at a few different points of the fight to the point where like, it was almost like they stopped it to fucking spare us. Like it was like they were like, "Oh, he landed a punch. Get it the fuck. Come on, get 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 out of here." He landed a punch. It was fucking. At sucked. least HBO, to their credit, this time realized that it wasn't Marquez's fault that that fight fucking sucked. Like it was straight up Gainer. So Roy he Jones was would not stop pushing Derek Gainer. Like he would be like, "If you're gonna yeah. put me on, you got to put Derek Gainer on too." Fuck that. that I'd be like, no. In that sense, thank God Roy finally got ice because once he got knocked out, we weren't forced to see Gainer anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no shit. <laughs> Anyways, um, but that at least got, you know, him into a fight with um Manny Pacquiao soon after that. And I will say, I mean, we all know how that career started and everything from that one, right? But I will say it was around this time when I first, now to go back to Rafael Marquez, that's when I first started discovering him was the early 2000s. I wasn't aware of Rafael Marquez. Obviously, like you said, he was way under the radar of his brother. Never really got pushed like that. I never saw him on television because I was on the East Coast and never really caught things um catch shows like that if he was televised so the first time i became aware of him was with a fight that wasn't televised it was uh, his first fight with mark johnson but they showed clips of it on hbo like little brief clips and they talked about how because it was a big upset jo yeah. initially i think they said that it was johnson was um announced as the winner 
and then that was the one where they had to go yeah back to his dressing room or something and then they realized that no marquez actually was the winner by split decision or some shit like that or was it was it a draw was split decision by marquez i think he won by split decision right uh announcement blah blah blah. oh it doesn't say but oh wait yeah and then it said made marquez the split decision split decision winner after they reviewed the scorecard god how dumb would that be if you were mark johnson No, you feel like Gabe Rosado, remember? I'd be when he fought with Danny Jacobs. <laughs> yeah, I'd be fucking um, pissed. So that's when I you know, that's when I, um, I was he was on my radar when I caught that. And even from the brief clips of that fight, it looked exciting enough that I was like, oh, I'd like to see what this is about. I mean, who the fuck beats Mark Johnson? Even though Johnson was out of jail and like clearly passed it, you know, whatever it may be, that was big. And so I'm like, all right. And then they had the rematch and he stops Johnson. And that's when now, okay, like, well, he's going to be starting to be featured now. And then he fights Tim Austin. And Tim Austin was one of my favorites, all right? Because, like... Timmy Austin I, was a good fighter, dude. He was a hell of a good totally fighter. Totally forgot about Ultimately, these Ultimately, he was buried, you know, on the doldrums of Don King undercards and Cincinnati stuff like that. Did. He was a bronze medalist at the 92 Olympics. He didn't have that many pro fights because he was, like, going through... I want to say management problems. Yeah, he had like managerial and shit. And some other shit like that. But yeah, he only had like 17 pro fights or so before he finally challenged um, Mobile Botili for the uh, Bantamweight title. And that was on Showtime. That was a hell of a fight. Botili broke his jaw. Broke Austin's jaw before Austin rallied back to stop him. And um, he was a good champion, you know. He didn't fight that often. It was always on some low-rent, you know, Showtime card or something like that. Nothing like in a major event or so but he had good wins on his record i remember he beat arthur johnson by easy decision he knocked it out um at the time it was getting popular what was his name adam vargas the don vargas yeah don vargas yeah who was making a name for himself that was that was on hbo um that dude who unfortunately killed his opponent before that fight steve dotsy was his name Mm -hmm. yeah he stopped dotsy and yeah so i mean like he was being featured on hbo for like these fights you know and um the marquez fight was awesome and especially the ending of it because i remember i haven't watched it in years but marquez i think was like hurt right and he was kind of real and then he rallied back and knocked austin out of the ring and yeah like he was that was like his signature like rafa marquez was rarely like dominant you know what i mean like he was you're gonna like ding him around then he's gonna come back and fuck you up like easily one of the hardest punchers too of of that time period sure and they just started and that's the thing that was beautiful about both of them is that like that started rafa marquez's own legacy on his own like outside of his brother he wasn't caught in anybody's shadow no one was ever like oh that's Juan manuel's brother it was always just rafael marquez that's one thing i always noticed about him you know what i mean yeah they definitely had their own kind of trajectories or whatever so i mean that was good for him because I think that's what was the thing was that he was he was Juan Manuel Marquez's little brother at first, you know, and he he carved his own fucking niche. Uh, and during that time, though, I mean, gosh, I mean, how many uh, defenses did he make then? He made one, two, three, four, five, five, six, seven, seven uh, defenses of the bantamweight of his IBF title. And during that time, so. I mean, Juan Manuel Marquez, dude, like I said earlier, Nacho Betty Stein, bad, bad manager. After he drew with Manny Pacquiao in the first fight, which was a great fight, and, you know, amazing that he even came back from that first round ass-kicking. Terrible stuff, but amazing that he came back from it and made it a draw. But the whole thing was that they were trying to negotiate for a rematch with Manny Pacquiao, and according to, you know, all of the news shit going around at the time, Basically, Manny Pacquiao had offered him X and it was a good, it was like a career high payday. And Nacho Betty Stein was like, no, we're not doing it unless we do do it for this amount. And it was something like they offered him 750,000 and they wanted twice that or something like that. And Pacquiao was like, fuck that, we're moving on. And so they moved on and Juan Manuel Marquez went ahead and defended for 30 grand against Chris John in Indonesia and, you know, got for in the eyes of many robbed of his title and basically once more had to start all over again um which was not totally true because he was already kind of on HBO and a star but like you know bad managerial decision here bad bad managerial decision and i mean regardless of how you feel about chris john 
a good fighter and a really pain in the ass fighter to fight. So in any case, Juan Manuel Marquez had to just kind of reset his shit during this time period. And again, Rafa Marquez had started carving out his own niche, defending, you know, cleaning out as much of the bantamweight division as he could. It wasn't the super strong division, but he fought and defeated one of the guys that I really enjoyed watching during this late 90s and early 2000s period. Fucking Chapo Vargas, dude. Ricardo Vargas, super fun fighter. <laughs> Somebody got to hit me with that fucking Chapo Vargas career set. He beat him. Um, he beat a... So there was a couple of guys... During the early 2000s, there was a few South African fighters who were starting to like make a little bit of names themselves in the in the U.S. You had like Cassius Beloy, you had Philip Endu, and you had um, uh, Silent Mabuza was another one. Mm. And he fought Mabuza fought Marquez twice and got stopped both times on cuts. And those were fights, especially their first fight was like, oh, it was you know because Mabuza had already gotten like a little bit of um. Uh, he had a couple of articles written about him in the ring and, you know, a little bit of hype around him and stuff like that. But he also had those type of cheekbones that just shredded like just paper and a guy like precision wise, like Marquez, who with those uppercuts and everything, I don't know, it was going to be food for him. So that's ended up happening. He also had one of the most vicious knockouts you would ever imagine. I think it was against, what was it? Harry Berto Ruiz. Yep. That uppercut. Yeah. 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 So like, you know, Marquez was just a dominant dude. Also too, like, I remember one of the most, I want to say it might have been the single worst uh, HBO doubleheader I've ever seen, where it was Rafa Marquez against Pete Fristina. And um, I think the main event was uh, Antonio Margarito against Hercules Cavallos, <laughs> or some shit like that. And, like, you know, both fights were just absolute pastings. Yeah, dude, Hercules Cavellos was like the Canadian welterweight champion or something like that. Yeah, and people yeah. are like, oh, like, let's see how he does. No, nah, he got destroyed. But I mean, Marquez was just an absolute bruiser, you know what I mean? But he needed someone to really define him, though, as opposed to just being like, okay, he was like a dominant champion during his era or whatever. But there's not going to be like nothing that really like makes him stand out besides him being like a dominant champion. And that's when Israel Vasquez came along. And when he moved up to fight him, that's what really solidified him in terms of his own legacy and Hall of Fame career and everything like that, because that still goes down. And most people will tell you, like, I, I ain't going to consider that fourth fight. No one with a conscience should. But if you think about that trio, the, the three fights that they had, their first three fights, that goes down with anybody and anything in history as three, like, doesn't matter. You know what I mean? And it's rare, absolutely fucking rare, for each fight to get better than the last one. And somehow they did that. Yeah, dude. I won't go through the whole story about the, you know, what they should be paid and all that type of stuff again, but they should have gotten paid better. All I know is that the trilogy, I mean, I don't count the fourth fight, no point in counting it, especially exactly. since it basically took Vasquez's eye. Um, you know, but the first three fights are just about as good as anything you could possibly see in boxing. They really were. I mean, that first fight, what was that? I think Vasquez got his nose broken or something. That's why they had to stop it. Yep. But it was kind of anticlimactic because, like, yeah, it was exciting, but you just felt like things were going to really start building up before that shit happened. Yeah, and like, then, that kind of halted the momentum a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the second fight, the momentum got halted, too, with the stoppage the way it was, but it was even better than the first because, like, they just kind of took off from what they did from the first fight. Like, it was just an automatic, you know, ridiculousness. And then that third fight, like, there's no reason to go, like, in depth about it because everyone that listened to the show has clearly seen them. But, like, that third fight will just go, like, the ebbs and flows of it was just incredible, you know. And then when it comes down to that last round and with the last few seconds left and, you know, Vasquez landing that flurry that got Marquez and, you know, made him score a knockdown is just, <sighs> that's on, like, you know, Chacon um, Lamon level shit of that last round when he knocks him down very at the very end, like, that's what got him. That's what sealed him the win. If anything, like that was the most beautiful. You couldn't have written, written a better ending for that type of shit. Like it was incredible. There was yeah. there were arguments afterward too that a lot of people thought that Marquez still should have won the fight even with the knockdown. I mean, like there was that's but that's part of what made it great too was the action. There was a lot uh, riding on it. Great shit, man. Loved that. It really was, but again, that you know, even though Marquez came out the less unscathed out of that trio, I guess. You know, Vasquez had the eye injuries and 
was worn out and all that. Because, I mean, when you think about it, when you combine the awards, Vasquez had more awards than Marquez. He did. Like, by the time he had that first Marquez fight, he had already gone through hell and back with Johnny Gonzalez. He had already, like, fucking had those wars with um, uh, Oscar Marcos. Mario's. Yeah, and just other stuff. Like, he'd been through it, you know? And um, it's incredible. And, like, Marquez was never really the same after that either. Like, yeah, he was champ, but, like, eventually you knew it was going to fall apart for him. And I forgot who ended up stopping him. Who was it? It was um, Japanese champ, right? Yeah, and Nishioka. Or no, Nishioka beat him. But uh, no, I mean, yeah. Juan Manuel Lopez. Uh, That's right. It was the one in my fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, was, it was It was one of those fights where you're like, had this been, you know, X amount of years earlier, this shit would have been a banger. But now, you know, not so much. But Sad yeah. time when Lopez was just going through and beating up all my favorites, like him and Jerry Penalosa and others. But um, you got to give it to them, man. Like, I don't know. Let me ask you this. You think they're the best brother duo in boxing history? Or the Klitschko's? I mean, they're, they're definitely up there, dude. But it, I have to say, it is kind of tough because, I mean, dude, if you get two brothers who both win the heavyweight championship legitimately, that's and tough, both dude. Heavyweight champions, too. <laughs> that's tough. Yeah, I'd have to say. They're up there, though. I'd have to say, if you're going to put, like, top three, top four, um, you have the Klitschko's, uh, Mar- I'm not like ranking them, I'm just saying in general, but you have like Klitschko's, the Marquez brothers, probably the Sphinx brothers. They have to yeah, be, up yeah. I mean, and you that could apply to both the Klitschko's or the Sphinx brothers, yeah. I mean, like Klitschko's overall, because Leon, unfortunately, his career just pettered as bad, yeah. Don't get me wrong, his reign was not, it was brief, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, but, like, but he those- won it. But those three, in terms of that, and like I'm sure we can do other family members of thinking like that. But like off the top of my head, that's Galaxy Brothers. I mean, uh, Ko oh, yeah, wasn't Galaxy nearly Brothers, as good yeah. as Kosai, but still, they were good. Sure, sure, definitely. But um, you know, last one I'll just mention briefly because we've talked about his career before. Before we get out of here, and it has to be mentioned though, but like this, um, it has to be Bernard Hawkins. You know. That's true, yeah. It's it, notable enough that I know the dude who defeated him to fight, despite not knowing shit about anything else in his career, Clinton Mitchell. Absolutely. <laughs> you know? And it's funny, too, because, like, there are people, you know, these young, stupid fans on Twitter. I remember uh, someone was like, uh, Loma had a better, you know, Loma lost to, you know, a uh, former world champion in his second fight. Who did Hopkins lose to in his first pro fight? Blah, blah, blah. And we're like, well, Loma was a former Olympian who was groomed to fight a former uh, a world champion in his second fight. Yeah. Hopkins was a guy that had just gotten out of jail who was used as an opponent for a New York Golden Gloves champion. <laughs> I mean, you know, in fucking on top of that, dude, like, it's like, well... The extra point is that Lomachenko fought in whatever that was, the World Series of Boxing or whatever it was, exactly. that's like like pro-am, so there's some controversy as to what, anyway, whatever. But no, um, Bernard Hopkins, obviously, definitely one of the more kind of coming up the hard way type of stories where we've talked about this before, where there have been fighters throughout history who've said, oh, you know, I went up the hard way, I got paid bullshit, and you're like, bro, every single one of your professional fights was on television and you got paid, you know, you're fine. But no, Bernard Hopkins really did for a large chunk of his career have to come up the hard way. Or if it wasn't, you know, if it was on TV, it was in a portion of the division where the stars were had the other belts. And he yeah. was the one who had to just trudge his way along because they didn't want to fucking fight him or they didn't really seem to call him out or anything like that. And so, you know, he... Uh, went through he had a significant amateur career by the way too so anybody saying like oh he came from jail and went to but he actually started boxing long before he went to jails or went to prison so that's a little bit of a myth that people are pumping out he was experienced he was not super green but he in his pro debut he did lose and he still did again take the hard road and fucking battles way through there absolutely he did and i mean it wasn't easy for him coming up either, you know, a guy that he fought a lot of tough middleweights and other stuff on, on the come up. And by the time his first world title fight comes up, it's against the fucking the incomparable Roy Jones Jr. You know, and like there's clearly levels at this point. Hopkins, like you said, even if he has a nice amateur career and everything like that, Roy is. Yeah, <laughs> there are two different points in their careers. Completely clearly. Way two different points, man, at that point. And Roy Jones was, I mean, Roy wasn't even going to, wasn't even the guy that he would still become. But 
Hopkins, you know, to his credit, was still competitive. Most guys would have got blown out. Most people were blown out by Roy Jones during that era. You know what I mean? Like, well, mm-hmm. I even get it. You know, if you went, the, you didn't go the distance with Roy during that time. And Hopkins, not only did he go the distance, he might have won a round or two on him. I haven't watched that fight in years and don't intend to. It wasn't that exciting. I'd say he won a good three rounds. Like, yeah. I mean, he won some rounds. He tried, you know, but that was clearly a Roy win. But again, there was no knock on him. That's just a slight setback. And once Roy moved up to super middleweight, that gave, you know, the middleweight division at that point, too, in the mid-90s, there was nobody really standing out in it as, like, an absolute, like, monster or, like, the star of the division. Things were just kind of, like, in flux. Like, you had Gerald McClellan, who, you know, was getting ready for, I decided to talk about him, but, like, he's getting ready on himself to move up to fight Nigel Ben. That was going to be tragic circumstances. Um, Julian Jackson was still in the mix, but he was way past it. And, you know, a stiff one was going to take him out sooner or later. And... Yeah, you know, it was it was going to get to a dark time at that point because yeah, it was. was you look at the rankings in the middleweight division during that time; they weren't good. No, no, and like you know, we saw the guys who end up emerging soon afterwards. William Joppy, dude, William Joppy defended the WA belt like ten times or something. It's like yeah. fucking crazy. The fuck? There was a lot of boring Showtime main events featuring William Joppy in the mid nineties. Julio yeah, Caesar, dude. I've seen <laughs> Sharifi, uh, Keith Holmes. You know. Not a good time to be in midway. So, anyways, Hawkins almost fucks it up again when he when he goes to Ecuador to fight Segundo Mercado, and who was from Ecuador gets dropped twice, and he's lucky to pull out a a, a draw in that fight. Which, by most accounts, anyone else would have had him as a loss because like you're fighting someone in their home country and you get dropped twice against them, and you know it's on YouTube. Yeah. And I'm not saying that, like, and I'm not saying, like, the draw wasn't justified. Like, it was a close fight. It was just the yeah, fact it was that, a close fight. The fact that, right. the fact that he it was happened legitimately Ecuador, hurt twice. Yes, and the fact that it happened in Ecuador, like, makes him extremely lucky that he pulled that out. You would think that anyone, you know, they would do everything in their power to make sure that Mercado yeah, the, would. The crowd was a little bit hostile. You know, it's like a mile and a half above sea level. You know, there yeah, are some yeah, excuses there for Hopkins, but still, he totally, was lucky. Totally. I can't recall them ever going back there either for a fight. But anyways, he fights Mercado in a rematch, stops him. And that's what starts the slow drawl of him until the early 2000s of him trying to get respect as champion. Because like we said, that middle league division just was not exciting. There was nothing going on really at that yep. time. And Hopkins was getting featured. I'm not going to say like his title defenses weren't. None of them were never. They, all of his title defenses were televised. Like... He was televised against Steve Frank, which was just ESPN, a- Fox, yeah. USA, Showtime. Fights, Fox, Showtime. He finally gets on HBO for the second time, besides the Roy fight, when he fights Simon Brown, who was completely watched at this point. But it's also how many people are watching it because I remember that card. It was three fights. It was David Reed against Robert Pushup Frazier, Hasim <laughs> Rahman, Jesse Ferguson, and Hopkins, um, Simon Brown. The show started at like 11.45 p.m. East Coast time, I remember, as a kid, right? The bo- uh, Reed and Push-Up Frazier went the distance. So did Hasim Rahman, Jesse Ferguson, which was 12 rounds. How many people were staying up at 1.30 in the morning or whatever fucking wild time it was trying to watch Bernard Hopkins about knock it out? As, the, <laughs> as they're watching fucking Hopkins do this. Exactly. Like, so that's what I mean by him trying to, like, get, like, you know the recognition he's trying to get he's not being featured on prime like time like you know he went through just about every significant 1990s promoter like you (laughs) know he dealt with just about any significant 19 you know murad muhammad fucking america presents fuck dude he like almost all of these defunct you know these promoters who like you know yeah dude he he went through almost all these handlers and promoters for a reason Part of it was him, part of it was them, part of it was the middleweight division being awful. And so yeah. when King consolidated with Trinidad, Holmes, Joppy, and, and Hopkins in the early 2000s, I mean, dude, it wasn't a great division, but it was just like, all right, finally we'll have some fucking consolidation here. Finally, there will be like one champion. That's what wound up happening. Hopkins took the entire fucking thing, uh, and that, that's really what built his legacy. I mean, he built it brick by brick with defenses before that. But this is really what made him. Absolutely. And before that, he wasn't the one that they wanted to win. You know what I mean? Like, he wasn't Mr. Exciting. And if anything, he was just annoying. Trinidad Jones was, was supposed to be next. Hmm? Trinidad Jones. Tito yeah. Jones was supposed to be next. That was, I mean, like, if you listen to the rumors and certain people over there, they'll tell you that that Sugar Ray Robinson trophy, which 
if I remember correctly, wasn't wasn't that's um, what Hopkins said. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wasn't given to him. Wasn't given to him in the ring after the fight. What it was supposed to be is because Trinidad's name was on that. Was on that. Yeah, that's what Hopkins. <laughs> I believe it, but that's what Hopkins what said I? later on. Yeah, and yeah, it took until the late nineties, even before that, before like a guy like Antoine Eccles, who had a personality, it was knocking everyone out left and right to for for Hopkins to beat him a couple of times before he was getting featured like that, and then. Yeah, during the tournament, he beats Keith Holmes. That fight wasn't exciting at all. That was like an afterthought on an HBO fight on an HBO broadcast. And then when Trinidad ripped off Joppy's head, everyone was like exciting and rightfully so. I mean, that was a brutal knockout, and that was real. And Trinidad looked brilliant that night. I still thought that Hopkins was gonna win. You know what I mean, I was telling everybody, and especially at my gym, which was filled with a lot of dudes who were Puerto Rican and did not like that I was saying that Hopkins was gonna whoop their hero. And um, this was like the height of Tito Trinidad's fucking fame for sure. Oh, it was bad. It was bad. I mean, like Dougie Fisher. When this is the one I first recognized who he was through um House of Boxing and stuff. Yeah, they did and a he, ton of shit for Hopkins Trinidad. He did in and that he whole was middleweight his tournament. Yeah. Bags for it. And he was getting shit from all these fans saying that he thought Hopkins would win. They were threatening him, saying they were going to fly out and get him and all this other stuff. Yeah, because they had a ton of exclusive coverage on Hopkins yeah. that was like, they had like this mini documentary and shit and people were pissed. Oh, and they were pissed. And he was like, and they were like, how dare you say he can't knock out Sheree Robinson? And he was like, why the fuck would I say Trinidad would knock out Sheree Robinson? <laughs> yeah, people were going wild, bro. For yeah. real. Uh, that was a brilliant performance. Hopkins, from beginning to end, just put on an absolute clinic. He didn't try to knock him out early. He just shut him down from the beginning to the end. Didn't, you know, just brilliant, brilliant performance. And that solidified himself in knowing, you know what, this is a great fighter here. Like, he's not flashy. There's nothing crazy, whatever about it. He doesn't need to go above and beyond. No Roy Jones theatrics. He just puts in the work and beats your ass. And he's been doing that for the better part of a decade now. And respect who he is. And I mean, look at the longevity he had, man. Like, you know, it was like between him and Jones, Jones never changed his style. And that's what happened with him and how he became fucked later on because he always just relied on his athleticism and thinking he was going to do those quick, those quick, quick, um, quick twitch things he would do would be able to always, you know, make him see, uh, see the day. And for a while it did until he couldn't do it no more. And then he started losing and catching L's and getting viciously knocked out. Whereas Hawkins evolved his style. And I mean, it wasn't like that much of an involvement. Like, you know, he always kind of like had the fundamentals down like that. But it was just like, he just relied more and more on him just being yeah, a master. His boxer. style was easier to tweak. Yeah. And he just became more of a master boxer who just relied on the fundamentals and showing everybody this is all you need to do without flash to get ahead in this game. You know what I mean? It's a pair of smarts and knowing how to fucking like handle yourself in the ring without and like minimizing what you have to do. Like don't do too much over it, but like, it just, you know, it worked. And I, I mean, yeah, he's a, he's and what in this day and age where it becomes much, much more difficult to label somebody an all time great because of the various things that go on this, because of the plethora of titles and the way the business is and, the less activity you guys have and the unwillingness to fight each other and all this other bullshit. Hopkins stands out because he always challenged himself each year, all the times, everything he did, he just kept on challenging himself. And anytime you're like, well, this is the time he's finally going to get whooped and knocked out or beat up or something like that. He would end up beating him. He beat Antonio Tarver after Tarver beat Roy Jones. He beat Kelly Pavlik when Pavlik was on the top of the world. He beat Winky Wright when Winky Wright had like, you know, all those momentum going for him. And not only did he beat these guys, he beat them by wide decision. It wasn't like these were close split decisions. He shut them all the fuck down. <laughs> it was 15 years between, you know, the time he defeated Felix Trinidad and the time Joe Smith Jr. knocked him out of the ring. But I, I mean, and I'm not, you know, I'm not bringing that up to slag Hopkins, but mostly just to say that he had already had longevity when he defeated Tito. Another 15 years. Fucking insane, bro. Sure. Insane shit. Let's see. Before we get out of here, I'll just go through real quick. Uh, I mean, even though it could be a whole nother show, but like, let's go through real quick. A handful of other fighters who lost their pro debut. Pepino Cuevas, Wilfredo Vasquez, Johnny Nelson, uh, Bone Crusher Smith, Miguel Vasquez, uh, Orlando Salido, and my boy, Johnny Gonzalez. And um, Miguel Canto. That's right. And there, there are actually other ones we're missing that we've left out too. Because I'd, I'd love to go find that article I was talking about 
that they did on the because it was a a much not yeah. a comprehensive list but a bigger list of fighters who lost their professional debuts and it was a bigger list than you'd think but nonetheless even just that that's like 15 fighters 15 pretty top fighters that lost in their pro debut so the lesson children because you know we have a massive audience of kids who listen to our show don't give <laughs> okay even if you're 45 even if you're 45 listening to the show or watching it don't give up that's the takeaway the moral yeah, of the right. story you might log some else don't I give mean, up you just never know like these careers the thing that's fascinating about boxing is that like it's not supposed to define someone over a loss and even if they don't become champion look at a guy like Kirino Va- uh Kirino Vasquez what's his name Garcia who was uh, a contender from the late 90s early 2000s he he lost what his first 15 20 like something fights or so you know he had Crazy. an absurd amount of losses in the beginning of his career absurd and then he ends up just winning in, uh, a bunch in a row challenges for a world title a couple of times beats a few world champion former world champions in the sense like you know you just don't take that as it is it is what it is you know what i mean and like today showing that these legends all-time greats whoever ended up taking an l and looking what they ended up doing since then you know proves that so well everybody hopefully you enjoyed the message of positivity but we appreciate you listening in or watching in whatever you wound up doing if you listened in go ahead and subscribe on the knuckles and gloves podcast however it is you listened leave a rating we appreciate that if you watched on youtube also go ahead and subscribe leave a rating comment those kinds of things we also appreciate that as far as social media goes not really on X slash Twitter anymore, but I mean, my profile's still up, but we'll see if I update it. I don't know. I'm kind of frustrated with that shit. That being said, boxing history, if you like that kind of stuff, but my boy Eris Pina is still there as Punch Zone Eris. Uh, the Knuckles and Gloves podcast is on Facebook and Instagram if you want to like us there. And Eris, we'll talk soon, bro. Have a good one, y'all. Yeah.